Hello and welcome back to Anointed Fire. My name is Tiffany Buckner and today I want to talk to you about deception in relationships. Well, let me go ahead and say this. First and foremost, I love what God is doing. If, you, if you're not paying attention, if you listen, God has been dealing with a lot of us regarding relationships, generational curses, mindsets. He is taking us all the way back. And anytime you see a cleansing, God is getting you ready for something. I want you to think about Esther. When Esther was going um, through the purification, she was actually getting ready, being made ready for the king. So anytime there is a purification going on, you need to jump in it. Listen. A lot of people don't understand this. A lot of people think that, okay, y'all heard me talk about, like, I'll put a message out there about holiness or deliverance or something like that. And there are so many of you who will not come out and read those messages, not understanding that it is a purification mes message that God is getting his daughters ready. I call it getting the oil, getting the oil that you'll need to get the answer to your question or to finally walk in the gate and amen for the petitions that you put on heaven's desk. It's fine. Finally getting to the point where you can step in and receive what God has for you. A lot of people will ignore messages because they're just like, well, you know, uh, I'm not interested in demonology. So, hey, I don't need to re listen to anything about a Jezebel spirit. And then they end up married to somebody who has the Jezebel spirit or somebody who has an Ahab spirit. And somebody else is in that person's family is operating as a Jezebel in their husband's lives. And then all of a sudden they go to digging up messages like, hey, I need some messages about the Jezebel spirit. Can you point me to some books? Can you give me some advice or what have you? So I've learned that you got to think about it this way. A country does not prepare for war in times of war. A country prepare for, prepares for war in times of peace. That means that when you don't have a problem, you go ahead and prepare for the problems that are to come, the ones that you know are coming. There are going to be problems in marriages. Marriage is not a perfect institution. You don't go into marriage and then everything is going to be hunky-dory. I want you to understand that marriage is an institution that is um, being held together by two imperfect people. And the only way it's going to stay together if the two of them lock their hands in Christ Jesus and submit to God and allow their flesh to die. Flesh is what destroys marriages. So again, today I want to talk to you about deception in relationships. I'm noticing a trend. And like I said, I love what God is doing. I love how God is moving and he's taking us and he's purifying us. He's taking a lot of stuff out of us, fear, rejection, and all that stuff, timidity. He's removing all those things. And then he's, you know, just taking us through the purification process and he's getting us ready, not just for the king on earth, you know, not for the husband, but for the king of kings himself, who is God. He's getting us ready. So so that's the great part. So anyhow, I got an email and I want to read this email to you and to the young lady who sent me the email. I hope you don't mind. Um, first and foremost, let me say this. If you send me a message, remember, go to my website, TiffanyBuckner.com and do the Ask Tiffany. You do it through the Ask Tiffany. If you do it through the Ask Tiffany, I will see it. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, I did Ask Tiffany a long time ago and I never got an answer to my question. Well, your question may be all about you and not so much about anybody else. Like, I don't do Ask Tiffany segments where the question can just basically help one person. I do Ask Tiffany segments when it's something that's viral, something that most people need to hear. Now, if you do a personal one-on-one -on -one Ask Tiffany, that's different. If you submit a question that way, then I'm going to answer. But if you ask a question that I don't feel like can really benefit anybody else, I'm not going to answer. So with that being said, this particular question that I got, I feel like a lot of you can, um, can benefit from the answer. And the reason is, is because of how the enemy had me deceived some years ago. I realized that we are all at some place in our walks or what have you have you sold to the asker I see where you are, but I got to tell you to come out of it. I got to tell you. So anyhow, I want to go ahead and read the question. And like I said to the young lady who sent it, I hope you don't mind me reading it. Um, when it goes through the proper channel, if you send it through the Ask Tiffany segment, then I know if it's a personal or a private, um, if it's a public or a private question. If you send it via email, most of the time I ignore emails, like ladies, most of the time I ignore emails, but if you send it to an email, I'm not going to know. Um, and if you, know, you do it private, anyhow, through Ask Tiffany, remember that private sector is a paid sector. That means that if you do something one-on-one, -on -one, that's paid because it's not going to benefit anybody else but yourself. So anyhow, this is going to benefit a lot of people. So I hope you don't mind me reading it. So I'm not going to read your name. So don't worry about that. Anyhow, here's the question. 
Thank you so much for allowing God to use you and helping us. I was listening to your channel on how to get an answer to your prayer. I have a deep question and some and need some spiritual advice, and I can't share it with people. I know. I was dating this guy for three years. He was separated from his wife, but not divorced. Our relationship was so beautiful, nothing to complain about. All of a sudden, he told me that his wife is dating someone, and he doesn't want any other man around his children, so he's going back to her. I am devastated. It's hurt like a pain I've never had, and I am heartbroken. Now I'm praying earnestly for God to send him back to me. I'm fasting. I can't eat. I love him, and he called me and told me that he still loves me and misses me. Should I continue to pray for this man to leave his family and to come and be with me? Please help. Any godly advice is appreciated. Thank you, and God bless you. So to the woman of God who wrote this, listen up. I'm going to tell you, and I got to tell you in love, and I like Y'all, y'all here because some of y'all on here, some of y'all listening, you're in a similar situation. I'm going to tell you in love and I want you to go ahead and and forgive me in advance because I have to teach you because I used to be there. I know where you are. I've been there before. So I got to be your big sister in the Lord right now. So let me tell you, you're operating under a spirit of deception. And let me tell you this. First and foremost, he was married, meaning you were in adultery. You were in adultery. And so while you're in adultery, God is not a part of that relationship, which means it is an ungodly relationship. Unlike God, without God, it was an ungodly relationship. It was a relationship of adultery. So first and foremost, you have to repent of that. If you don't repent, you're going to continue to attract men like that. You got to continue to attract men who are going through a divorce. How do I know? Listen, I was um, operating under that deception when I was a young lady. I met my first husband. He was going through a divorce. He had already signed the papers. His um, wife then had already signed the papers. So I justified being in a relationship with him. I said to myself, it's not like I'm taking him from anybody. It's not like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm playing tug of war. He's already going through a divorce. It's going to be finalized any day now. So I justified my relationship with him. Over the course of their marriage with him. Now, during the courtship, the courtship or the relationship, because it really wasn't a godly courtship, more so um, dating. During that relationship, in the beginning, everything seemed perfect. Everything seemed so perfect. Like, I felt like we were created for each other. I felt like we were supposed to be together. I felt like the reason it didn't work between the two of them was because we were supposed to be together. See, I was young in the faith. I had just came to Christ. I didn't understand a, a lot. So, I got into that relationship and he did go through a period where he started to regret walking away from his wife. He started to regret it. And that's normal for a person going through a divorce. I want you to understand that God did not create us to marry and to divorce. He did go through a period. How do I know? Because we used to talk. And I remember one time he told me, and at this time I was, you know, still in the dating relate, uh, dating process with him. And I was going over to his parents' house and staying, you know, uh, weeks at a time with him. And I'll never forget. He said to me, I think you ought to go home. And I said, for what? And he said, you know, cause Tiff, I find myself thinking about my ex. And he said, it's like, I'm, I start, I'm starting to feel like I'm confused. Now I love you and I want to be with you, but I, I guess there are some feelings there about her that I haven't checked yet. And I kind of feel like I need to sort through them. And I was young at the time. I didn't know how to deal with that. I had never really been in a serious, serious relationship. So I went into panic mode. I was like, Oh no, 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 no. I'm right for you. You already said this. And I just went through these motions and emotions and, you know, crying and sitting there talking to him until he finally conceded and said, you you know what? You're right. You and I, we love each other. And that's that. Okay. Listen up. That was a spirit of adultery, right? See, now I was sitting back and I was trying to justify that relationship. Now, over the course of that marriage, I had to deal with a lot of adultery because what I had sown into was what I ended up reaping. You shall reap whatever you sow. That's why I could not get mad. Now, initially I could be frustrated with some of the women that was in it, but at the end of it, it was so easy for me to forgive those women because I had to keep looking at the fact that, you know what, you got this man 
in the wrong way, even when we were in that relationship and all that. And I remember a couple of times the woman he had been married to had passed by the house and I'm sitting there all puffed up and talking crazy, not even understanding that her heart was broken. I didn't understand it at that time. I was too silly and unlearned. I didn't understand it at that time. So I justified my relationship with him and I ended up biting back or getting a, a taste of what I had given to somebody else. So that was a adultery that was adultery the next thing I want you uh, I want to address is you know him saying he went back to his wife because she's dating someone else that's not necessarily the case it may be true but it's not necessarily the case I want you to understand that when a man gets married it is very hard for him to walk away from his wife I know some of you said well my husband walked away from me it wasn't easy for him believe it or not you have some cases where it's easy for a guy but for the most part it is not easy for a man to walk away from his wife he has to be in some strong demonic deception for him to walk away from his wife but what ends up happening is love will start to override that demonic deception there's a time when a man's walking in the spirit of offense when he's walking in the spirit of entitlement he's walking in the spirit of lust he starts dealing with a lot of things but eventually love will begin to override those feelings meaning even though a man can walk out on his wife and some of you who are married your husband has walked out on you you need to hear this a man can walk out the door on his wife and leave her to be with somebody else and begin to build a family with that other woman but if you don't contend with him meaning you don't keep him in the spirit of offense because if you make that thing strong you make it easy for him if you don't continue to contend with him if you don't contend with the woman if you're not passing by wherever the woman stays or wherever he's staying if you're not going up on Facebook and condescending him and cutting him down eventually his love for you is going to start to override those demonic urges eventually his love for you will begin to override those things now I'm not saying Saying that oh when those things start to happen you should be open your arms and welcome him no he needs a new heart and a new mind he needs deliverance he needs salvation there's a lot of things that that man needs if he has salvation he needs a new heart and a new mind and he needs to come to understand that what he's doing is not only hurting you but it's going up against the living God and it breaks God's heart so the thing that you need to understand is that during those three years he was in deception and you helped to make that deception stronger let me tell you how when he was in that deception here it is that instead of him going through the normal grieving process he's got you see you got to go through grieving after a divorce I learned that the hard way I learned that the hard way guys you got to go through the grieving you got to go through the forgiving there is a process that you go through he did not go through that process instead he jumped into another relationship which means that the relationship was condemned from that moment. So instead of him being with you because he loves you, you become a crutch. You become the thing that's helping him to get around all of those feelings. But I don't care if it's 15 years later, those feelings are going to come back up. They're going to come up. If they're not dealt with, those things will come back up. Ask me, how do I know? When I went through a divorce back in 2000, I think in 2007, I was going through a divorce from the first man I had married. And I was sitting back and I was operating under a spirit of deception. I was Christian. I love God and I wanted God to be pleased with my life. However, I was still walking in some generational curses. I still had a lot of the old man and I was just sitting back, you know, going back into this same old uh, process that I had just came out of. So here I was. Now, remember I told you that when I met my first husband he was going through a divorce now here I was all of a sudden I was going through a divorce and I met a man and I ended up with this guy and we ended up you know start talking about marriage and um and he wasn't the first guy that I dated you know while I was going through a divorce because I justified it see that means that the lesson still hadn't kicked in yet that lesson still had kicked in, which meant that I still had a whole lot of pain ahead of me. I still had a whole lot of pain ahead of me because God was looking like, okay, here goes some more fruit. Here. Okay, so these things are growing up in our heart. Okay, so these are the roots that's in our heart. These are the things that has to be dealt with. And in order to get the roots out the ground, you got to pull the ground up. You can't just take uh, your hand and pull it up, and, you know, unless it's uh, rooted at the top. And even if, even if thin, it's going to hurt you. But most roots go very, very deep. It takes a lot to pull those roots up. So 
Here I was. I started dating while going through a divorce. And in the beginning, the, when I met my second husband, I told him I was divorced because that's how I saw myself. Because I was still angry. I was still, you know, I had forgiven my ex for the first, for the, for the most part. I had prayed for forgiveness, but I was still a little disappointed. So I would use the term, we're divorced. You know, I would always tell people we were divorced. So I let that come out of my mouth with him. And I didn't tell him that the divorce hadn't been finalized yet. He just thought I was recently divorced. It wasn't until about a month or two into our relationship and we started talking about, you know, the possibility of marriage and all this other stuff. It wasn't until then that I was, um, became honest with him that I told him the truth that I said, Hey, listen, you know, my divorce should be finalized any day now. However, it's not finalized. As a matter of fact, um, it's not going to be finalized any day. Uh, I take, take that back. I told him I'm still waiting on my ex to sign the papers. He's giving me trouble with signing the papers because, of course, my ex had gone through a regret. Now, listen, he had left to be with another woman. He had left to be with another woman because he was under deception. Because in that stage, the thing is, he's looking at the relationship like, okay, so... You know, this new car smell, everything over here feels good, but I know what I'm getting with Tiffany. And it was an abusive relationship. It was a whole lot of crazy stuff. So I always tell people that I believe that God rescued me. That was God's way of rescuing me. He allowed this man to be led astray in his deception or what have you. And that was God's way of rescuing me. But see, the thing was, I didn't realize that I was being rescued. So I ran back into another relationship. And so here it is. I'm starting to, to have feelings for this guy. And I started telling him all these things and you know um i said you know i'm trying to get him to sign the papers then must start passing and this soul tie because we're talking all the time this soul tie was getting stronger and stronger because now he's sowing things into my heart and my heart is not guarded because it's still broken I'm, i haven't gone through the process of healing yet you know so he's sowing things into my heart that's why it is not good for you to get into a relationship when you have a broken heart because a broken heart is very easy to sow into that's why witches love women who are broken that's why witches like to come upon you when you are hurting and they say baby girl you come over here let me hug you uh-uh don't worry about it. what's his name uh, uh we got him baby girl that's why witches love people like that because a broken heart is very easy to sow into that's why god said he is not near the broken heart it's because a broken heart is very easy to sow into so here I was, and I'm in this other relationship, and this soul tie is getting stronger and stronger until this thing became, you know, just so strong that the enemy was able to just pretty much bewitch me, deceive me, and into, so I got to the point where it's like I could not see the obvious truth about this man. Like the truth was sitting out there. Now that my eyes are open, I can be honest with you, the truth was wide open, but here I was dating while going through a divorce in that same old deception, same old deception going through a divorce and I justified it I said well you know what you know um, our relationship was contentious he was always attacking me you know it was physical um, it was a lot of abuse plus he left to be with somebody else so that I told myself you know what God's not gonna punish me because listen up you know, it's not like I'm leaving him for another man. I'm sitting here. I was back in my mother's house. I had lost my house. I had lost my car. I had lost everything that I had was back in my mother's house, sleeping on a mattress on the floor. So I was sitting there thinking to myself, then it is justified where I am. It's justified for me to be in a relationship. No, it wasn't. God was humbling me. That mattress on the floor represented me being humbled. God was taking me through a process because he has to break down the old and in order to build up the new, all of the old, you can't take that old wine and put it in a new wine skin. All of the old, or you can't take that new wine and put it in an old wine skin. All of the old has to decompose, has to break down. See, you can go through dying, but still you got to go through decomposition. And I, I was in a dying process, but I did not let myself die completely. I did not allow decomposition of the old man to take place. So I jumped back up and, you know, I was back in that shawty's these bones live. I made myself breathe life back into the dead girl and I jumped back into another relationship jump back into so already I'm thinking oh I want to marry this guy this man like we're perfect our relationship is perfect there's nothing wrong with him like everything about us okay so he not really saved but 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 you know he's a good guy he, he said his mom and dad was married all the way up until um his dad's passing I mean this guy don't even believe in divorce this guy he's not even American so I was operating in deception the the truth was right there for me but I was operating 
operating in deception. Fast forward, got into that marriage and went through hell. Got into that marriage. Now, the courtship, anytime you're in a demonic relationship, and we're going to call it what it is, it, it, it's devil built. Anytime you're in a relationship like that, the courtship, the relationship, it feels um, surreal. It feels like um, almost like enchantment. It, it feels like you're in this in this place where you it, you ignore the, the obvious, you ignore everything else. You're floating on this cloud, and it's really deception. It's called bewitching. Paul asked the church, he said, "Who has bewitched you that you will not believe the truth?" So I understand that it's in that stage you're you're being bewitched in a sense. You're bewitched by words. The Bible talks about a woman deceiving a man with her words. So I want you to understand, a man can deceive a woman with his words. He can even deceive himself with his words and his thoughts. Just like you can deceive yourself with your words and your thoughts. So I was under strong, strong, strong deception, very strong deception. And I just got into that relationship. And even though God started opening ways of escape for me, I would not walk out of it because I was like, nah, 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 this guy's perfect. Like this guy, me and him, we, we, you know, we got a lot in common. Plus, 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 you know, he real smart. He speak five languages. Didn't pay attention that he didn't speak in tongues. He, he, he's traveled the world. He is in school to do some great things. As a matter of fact, he was about to graduate. I was looking at all of the benefits. And I was like, man, then he's not even American, so I don't have to worry about dealing with um, certain cultures that, you know, destroy marriages. Like hip-hop culture, I'm going to be honest with you, hip-hop culture destroys marriages. So... I was thinking to myself, all of these cultures in America, a lot of these cultures that come up against marriage, and then I didn't even consider his culture. I didn't even consider what his culture was like. I didn't look into that. And it was very um, it was very difficult in that marriage. As a matter of fact, it was culture that started to give us problems. As a matter of fact, it was culture that started to break down that marriage. See, if you don't die to yourself, whatever you build, you're going to breathe life into. And then if you call yourself Christian, God's going to suck the life out of that thing because it becomes an, an idol for you. God will suck the life out of that thing and it becomes what we call a storm or a broken heart as we watch that building crumble that relationship crumble as those things began to crumble before us so what god was doing and this guy's relationship is basically rescuing you. See, he was away from his wife for three years. He didn't go, he didn't, he's not going back because another man is with his wife. I don't believe that. Now, it may be true, but it's very rare. He's doing that because he's gotten to that place where that deception is beginning to wear off. He's had you for three years, so now he's accustomed to you. You've become an unofficial wife, so now it's like he's accustomed to you. So now he's looking at his priorities and he realizes that she is greater. I don't say that to break your heart. I say that so that you can heal, so that you can come to the revelation. A wife is always greater than a girlfriend. A wife is always greater than a girlfriend. Once a man makes vows, it is not easy for him to wake, walk away from those vows. He may back up. He may go and try to be with somebody else. But I want you to understand me having been married twice. Let me tell you how a guy does when he's operating in deception, especially if, if it involves another woman. He's not going to ask for a divorce. In most cases, he's not going to ask for a divorce. You would have to ask him for a divorce. And let me tell you why. The reason he's not going to ask for a divorce, you can ask pretty much any woman who's ever been married, who's ever lost her husband to the man going to be with somebody else. In most cases, he's not going to ask for a divorce. He's just going to go and try to be with the girl. Now, the, thing, the reason he's doing that is because he wants to be able to come back. He does not want a divorce. He doesn't want that. Most guys who walk away from their woman to be with somebody else does not want a divorce. They do not want a divorce. They want to go and experience experience the other woman they want to see what it's like they want to see if it's more peaceful over here is it going to be um i'm dealing with all of this adrenaline because you know when you go into something that's wrong a lot of times you deal with it, there there's this adrenaline rush and it, it gives you this it, it's really a counterfeit orgasm it gives you a counterfeit everything so is this adrenaline rush there's this excitement that's over here in this relationship with you he doesn't realize or he doesn't want to do the work that's necessary because when you get married you got to work at that thing marriage is not something that's automatically good it is work it is constant work it's having uncomfortable conversation it is forgiving one another time and time again it's seeing each other in your worst state he sees you in your worst state so he has to put the work in. So I want you to understand there was a lot of work that he put into that marriage. And the value of that work is still in that marriage. But the relationship he has with you is basically, okay, 
you helping me to get past this. My heart's broken because my wife wouldn't do what I told her to do. Or, you know, something happened in my marriage. My heart's broken, so you helping me to justify. So I'm in a stage where I don't want to repent for the things that I've done. So you helping me to feel like that I'm right. You helping me to feel like, you know, yeah, uh, she was wrong because now you're saying you're willing to do for me what it is that she wasn't willing to do for me. And then he goes in there and he's led astray. It's deception. And the enemy will use you as devil bait. And he goes into that thing year after year. But then, believe me when I tell you, if you were ever to have a conversation with the wife, and I don't recommend this, the wife would tell you in those three years he had been talking to her. In those three years he had been communicating with her. And he was telling her, I love you. I want to be with you. And this, but for those three years, not times out of 10 he couldn't get her back because of his relationship with you it wasn't that he was rejecting her it was because nine times out of 10 she was rejecting him I'm telling you this because I used to be a wife I've been a wife twice I walked in that and see when a van does that he's you know just trying to see can I get back with you uh, are you willing to change like in the in the beginning when he's under the deception and he has another woman who's saying your wife was wrong and I would do that for you he's under strong deception he will try to go to his wife without repenting and say well you did this wrong and you did that wrong and most cases the wife realizes that listen if I took you back in the stage that you're in you're not going to change so no I do not want you so he sat back there and he was with you because he thought my wife is going to stay on layaway. She's going to stay on layaway. But at some point he started to realize, hey, hey, she's about to walk out. So I'm going to have to give up something. I got to make some sacrifices. I got to come and acknowledge that I was wrong. I don't want to lose this woman. That wasn't my intention. My intention was to break her down. My intention was to get what I wanted. This was my extended hissy fit. This was my, this was my extended temper tantrum. I was just basically trying to get what I want. I was standing my ground because there are some stubborn, some stubborn people out there in marriage who will sit back and basically, okay, well, we're going to separate over dumb stuff because they're too busy trying to get their way. And they will separate for years because they're trying to get their way. And so he sent back and he had this hissy fit or this temper tantrum for three years and now he realizes my wife is probably about to move on he probably suspects that she's with somebody else or nine times out of ten she sat back and started talking about the divorce she said hey listen we've been separated for three years and um it's not getting any better you know you've obviously moved on with your life so i want a divorce now i want you to ask any man ask any man any man will tell you when a man hears those words he's going to straighten up and he's going to say wait hold up hold up hold up hold up no 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 we got to talk about this that's not what i wanted i've been thinking about you lately and you know i realized how wrong i was you i'm telling you from a woman who's been divorced <laughs> or who's been married so I, I i'm sorry i know i did wrong or what have you the thing is he he's coming back to what he wants that's what he really wants. That's why he hadn't divorced her in three years. You were in deception. You were in an adultery, um, an adulterous relationship. You were the adulteress. He was an adulterer. So God was not going to bless your union with him. Even if he divorced his wife, your relationship with him was not going to be blessed. And it becomes a generational curse or it becomes a curse. That's something that you're going to constantly walk in until you completely repent of it and you walk away from it. I'm telling you what somebody should have told, told me back then. I'm telling you what I wish somebody had told me because I did a message. I don't know if you heard it, but some of you may have heard it. Some of you have may have it. I was going through a divorce when I met my, um, excuse me, my first husband. He was going through a divorce when I met him. My second husband, I was going through a divorce when I met him. Okay, back in 2015, opportunity opens up. This, I got this prophecy regarding a man that, you know, oh, God said your husband is going to be wearing a doctor's coat and all this other stuff. This man reached out to me wearing a doctor's coat. I'm just sitting here, and it happens to be an ex of mine. And I was excited. I was like, wow, I would have never thought, like, after all these years, 20 years later, that it's going to be him. This guy reaches out to me and he starts telling me all of these things. And I'm just like, okay, okay. I give him my number, you know, because we're communicating over um, Facebook. You know, so I give him my number and I'm excited. My heart is leaping. I didn't, you know, look like these prophecies are starting to come to pass. That's why you got to check a prophecy. You got to test a prophecy. You cannot just grab a hold of every prophecy that comes your way because you will end up getting deceived and you will end up allowing the enemy to lead you astray. So here I was, I was like, you know, getting excited, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I, this guy reaches out to me, like I said, ex from um, several years ago, from more than 20 years ago. And he starts telling me, he told me um, over 
Facebook that he was divorced. Okay, so when we get on the phone, we talk and we're having a great conversation, you know, and I'm talking to him. And at first, I'm avoiding the obvious question. Where are you in Christ Jesus? But, you know, I only avoided it for probably about an hour or what have you. But sitting there, we were just catching up. And he was talking about how over the years, you know, I've always been thinking about you over the years. I never got you off my mind. He's saying everything that a woman wants to hear. And, then, you know, I'm like, yeah, so, yeah, I hear you divorced. And we're talking good. And then finally he throws a bombshell. My divorce will be final <laughs> any day now, any day now. So do you see that there was a curse that was trying to reestablish itself? Because I repented when I was with my second husband. I repented of the spirit of divorce. I repented of the spirit of adultery because anytime you go after a married man, even if he's going through a divorce, you are an adulteress. You're going after a man who's already uh, linked to somebody who's already one with somebody else. And God's not going to bless that relationship. I repented of that. I acknowledged to God. I confessed to him with my mouth that what I did was wrong. I said, God, that was wrong. I confessed it to him and I repented. So here it was. Remember, the Bible talks about when when uh, an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it goes out looking for rest, but having found none, it says, I will return to the place from whence I came. And it comes back and it finds that place swept and everything put away. And then it goes and takes seven spirits more wicked than itself. And the last state of that person is worse than the first state. So this was the an example of a demon trying to return. This was an example of of a demon trying to return. I've been delivered from adultery and I made up my mind that I wasn't going back to it. So here it is. This man is a good idea, but he isn't a God idea. And I started, I could feel those, those, those emotions that they used to come back in the day. You know, you, you can feel it. Cause I'm like, okay, he said like in a week or so, his marriage should be uh, final. His divorce should be finalized and everything. And he's telling me all of these things that help happen in his marriage. And I'm listening, but then the spirit of God is in me contending with that stuff like you know better than this you know better than this Tiffany and God was contending so here it was I did what a lot of Christian women do I just started talking with my mouth you're not my husband you're this but I'm still talking to him see I'm still talking I'm still communicating because obviously obviously even though I was convinced I had allowed myself to you know kind of open up a door to you know just listen for the enemy to plead his case even though that that case had been already settled in court I was allowing the enemy to plead his case because he was trying to reestablish a new case in my life. So I'm talking to this guy and I'm saying all the right things. But the fact of the matter is I was talking to him. I talked to this man for three days on the phone, three days. The third day, the Lord rebuked me strongly. The third day, the Lord let me know you are you're starting to enter a soul tie, a soul tie. The enemy is trying to get you into a soul tie with this guy. You know this isn't your husband. You're doing it, and you're just being selfish. You're not even considering that this man is going through a divorce. Meaning there's a wife involved. You know better than this. And I sat there and I said, Lord, I repent. And I I I let that guy know. Look, you can't call me no more. You can't call me. And he went through that. Well, Tiff, you know, I believe you're supposed to be my wife and all that. I said, no, you can't call me. I, no, no, no. And I tell people to this day, I know, I, I can tell you this without a shadow of a doubt. If that divorce had a finalized, because I never, I don't know what happened with him. I had to make sure that I cleansed myself of that. You know, it wasn't a relationship, but the enemy was trying to establish something in my life. So what I had to do was I had to go through purging that stuff out. Those three days, I had to purge that out. Even though it wasn't deep, I had to purge purge it out. So what I had to do was delete him off my Facebook page. I had to tell him, do not contact me. I had to make that very, very clear. And I had to sit there and deal with the fact that, man, that was a good idea, but it wasn't a God idea. And I tell people to this day, if I had a stuck with him, if that divorce did finalize, I can honestly tell you, me and him would be married by now. We'd probably be in uh, fighting right now and getting ready for um, our, our next divorce because we would be divorcing each other because we were not assigned to each other because God would not have been in that relationship because it was a relationship of deception. It was a relationship established by the enemy, and God cannot get the glory of me standing on a pulpit and say, I got him when he was going through a divorce. I got him. I took him from somebody. God cannot get the glory because I will be empowering the women out there who are adulteresses when I should be helping them to go toward deliverance. And that's what I want you to do. You got to get, go for deliverance. I want to address the next part of the question. Um, the next, uh, next, another part of the message. And let me see, give me a second guys. Um,
Okay, now I want to address you praying for God to destroy his marriage and bring him back to you. I want to call it what it is. It's called witchcraft. See, this is what happens when you enter rebellion. Remember, the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. What I found is that rebellious people enter witchcraft like they just don't know the difference. The line is so thin. They always enter witchcraft. This is witchcraft that you're doing now. So now the Bible said that God hates a divorce. The Bible also warns us against witchcraft right now. And I have to be honest with you right now, you're practicing witchcraft and you, you deal, that's called a prayer gone amiss is a prayer and error. Meaning even though it's rising up, God's casting it down. Just like he tells us to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring it, to, bring it to captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ, because you're operating in strong deception, you have started to operate in witchcraft rebellion. Always y'all hear me when I say this rebellion, always not sometimes rebellion always leads to witchcraft. And most of the time it's witchcraft. You don't even know you're practicing. Most of the time it's witchcraft that you're unintentionally involved in. So right now, praying for God to destroy this man's marriage, it is witchcraft. And this is the reason that the enemy brought you into his life and brought him into your life. Because the enemy understood that there were some things in you that need to be healed. There are some things in you that has to be broken. And it can be generational. It can be something that you've established ever since you were alive. But those are some things that has to be broken. And the enemy knows that. And the enemy know, knew if I get him with her long enough, I can get her into witchcraft. Do you see how he leads people? People outside of Christianity and into his will and I'm gonna tell you once you start entering the realm of witchcraft a lot of things begin to attack you so I'm warning you to stop doing it I'm letting you know don't do that what you need to do is wash your hands of this man repent of adultery repent of that relationship and make up your mind to not go back because if you don't repent meaning you don't get to the point where you are against adultery so that you turn back with God and you begin to war against adultery then you're going to find yourself in that same cycle that i was in somebody else is going to come along and i'm going to tell you a lot of times what they'll do is they're not going to tell you that they're um, still married. They'll just be dating you and taking you out and all this other stuff. And then they'll wait till you establish a soul tie until you get a little locked in. And they'll tell you, okay, it was just something I, I should have told you, what have you. But, you know, I, I'm married, but we separated. But, you know, we going through a divorce and all. But, you know, um, it's just that she won't sign a paper. Some of y'all, you're sitting there cringing because you're in that right now. But they will he start telling you that that's deception. So I need you to understand. I'm telling you this so that God can spare you because you don't know where the enemy is trying to lead you. But you need, you do need to understand this. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. He wants to kill you. He wants to steal from you. And he wants to destroy you. Now, I know you're probably saying, what's the difference between kill and, and destroy? Anything that's killed, anything that's killed leaves the earth. Anything that's destroyed cannot, um, it, it's taken away from God. Meaning, destru destruction, if God destroys something with fire, there is no recovery of that thing ever. There is never any recovery of that thing ever. Somebody in hell is destroyed. That's what, that's the very example of destruction. Somebody in hell has no chance of redemption because they're already in hell. So the enemy comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. God said, because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. So you got to get to the point where you better get hot. You better get over here where God is and don't play with the enemy. When you start playing with witchcraft, you have entered a whole new realm of evil. And when you go into that place, when you go to intentionally, intentionally praying prayers of witchcraft, you release spirits against this man's marriage. You release spirits against him. And these spirits are coming up against this man's home. You're releasing things. And I'm going to tell you, it makes it even worse when we say we're Christian because God has to bring you down real quick to give himself glory. And he will allow you to go to the enemy. He will turn you over to to the enemy to a reprobate mind meaning you won't even know the difference anymore because right then to be reprobate means to be damned it means to be condemned you are already condemned before you leave the earth so God can turn you over to a reprobate mind and that is not what you want that's why I'm urging you to stop it right now stop look stop going after him he is not your husband that is another woman's husband stop trying to pray against his marriage that is a, that is witchcraft 
that is witchcraft. Anytime you pray against the will of another human being, it is witchcraft. Anytime you pray against the will of God, it is strong witchcraft because right now you are no longer just contending with the person. Now you are, you are literally standing on the side of Satan with a sword and you're fighting against the living God. And I'm telling you as a warning, that is the quickest way to get consumed. That is the quickest way to bring, be brought down. If you don't believe me, study the, study the story of Saul. Saul went, he was turned over to a reprobate mind. He was turned over to a reprobate mind. Saul went and consulted the witch of Endor. He died the next day. He died the next day. I don't tell you this to scare you. I tell you this to get you to repent and realize, hey, 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 I don't want no part of that. I don't want no part of that. And I want you to understand. And y'all hear me. I say this in love. Saul's not in heaven. Saul's not in heaven. Even though God used him mightily, Saul is not in heaven. Saul is not in heaven. You got to get to the point where you believe the word of God and you follow that thing all the way out. There are going to be seducing spirits that come out to deceive you in relationships. So you said that you're fasting. See, that means that you're, you're going deeper and deeper into the, the witchcraft. See, you're not fasting for God's will. You're fasting against God's will. So now you're going deeper and deeper and deeper into the witchcraft. I want you to understand that um, there are women um, out there that are intentional witches, that they actually go out and they intentionally do witchcraft. And the strongest ones fast. The strongest ones fast. They will fast for days on end. Some of them will fast for 40 days. They will fast for days on end to get their will done. They will fast, meaning they're giving demons more and more and more control over them. See, whenever we fast to God, we are giving the spirit of God uh, more and more, you know, direction. We allowing him to take more and more control like, because we become so weak. We can't do much of anything. So then that's a sign of trust. We're saying, God, take over. God, take over. So that's what what happens whenever you fast outside the will of God, you are letting demons take over. You're weakening yourself to the point where the demon can actually get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger until that demon finally can take over. It won't be possession if you're Christian, but it will be to the point where that demon will start to control you. It, it, it'll start to bind you. There's a demon called mind control. There's a demon called mind control. And there's another one called mind binding. It called mind binding likes to stop you from operating in your purpose. Mind binding likes to bind you to memories. It likes to bind you to, to thoughts. Or it likes to bind you to trauma. It likes to make it where you can't stop thinking about a person. That's what mind binding. Mind control makes it where you walk in complete deception. Mind control is like when a person goes to a witchcraft church. I, I saw, I knew a girl who went to a church that was a witchcraft church and they had to break mind control over her. So mind control is more so you say there and it's like everything around you is saying this is deception but you can't see and mind control is is basically what it does is it makes you see things in a different way it's like having a control to your mind now, i can't possess you your will is still there but your will has been weakened so right now with the fasting you are actually weakening your will for the enemy you are actually and i'm going to tell you what's going to happen i got to warn you i love you enough to warn you what's going to happen if you don't stop you're going to weaken your will so much that those spirits are going to get a lot stronger. And the first thing they're going to do is begin to contend with your mind. They're not going to contend with the man so much. They got to break down your man, your mind. They got to break down your will all the more. So what they're going to do is they're going to make it where you can't get over this man. They're going to make it where... You're going to be obsessively thinking about him. They're going to be giving you ideas about um, hurting him, hurting yourself, hurting his wife. They're going to make it to the point where you're going to feel like, you know, uh, if, if this relationship don't come back together, then I don't think I'm going to be here anymore. And then you're going to start looking at him in such a hatred or start looking at his wife with such hatred. And it's going to be provoking you to do something to yourself or to him or to his wife. That's what those spirits do. Anytime you hear about a man or a woman going out and killing their lover or their former lover, one of the spirits that in operation it's called mind control it's called mind control so that that thing goes to talking to him and it's, it's basically basically taking control and it's just sitting there constantly talking i want y'all to understand that the, a demon is a personality it is a it, it's a it's like a person it is a personality and every demon has his own unique personality when we talk about mind control uh the demons of mind control have a, a unique personality that's how a deliverance minister can identify certain spirits you know the lord 
will let us know what we're dealing with in a lot of cases. But some cases, you may not necessarily know God is going to use you to discern. So there are sometimes you see a, a demon in operation and you can discern based on what the person is doing because every demon has its own personality. So the, you can discern the demon based on its personality. For example, when a person says to me, God knows my heart and I ain't no bad person. I know I'm dealing with Leviathan. That's the Leviathan spirit. I know that's the spirit of pride. And Leviathan makes it very hard for the person to repent. It makes it very hard for the person to see the truth. That's why, uh, like I said, Paul asked, and he said, who has deceived you that you will not, or who has bewitched you that you will not receive the truth? Well, anytime you're dealing with that, you're dealing with Leviathan. And anytime you're dealing with deception, you're also dealing with witchcraft. There are spirits of witchcraft, and there are many, many spirits of witchcraft that are in operation. And that witchcraft will make it very, very hard for you to hear the truth. The witchcraft will make it where, wait, well, see, and it makes you question. No, 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 but you don't understand. Okay, see, my situation, okay, it's different with me. That's what witchcraft will come in and do. It will make you deceived. It will make you, you know, look at the situation from, well, you don't understand what, what I've been going through. You don't understand. So what I want to tell you is to stop praying and stop fasting for him to come back to you. You got to stop doing that. And I want you to understand this, uh, the last line because I'm, I'm reading through your email as I go. I love him and he called me and told me that he still loves me and misses me. What you have for him is not love. Okay, I, ha I had to be quiet after that one. What you have for him is not love. It's called deception and obsession. It's called lust. It's called adultery. Those things, when they come together, we can often mistake them as love because it's so strong. That's why it's called a strong man. That's why it's called a stronghold. I want you to understand, these things are often mistake, uh, mistaken as love. As a matter of fact, it can be so strong that even the even most Christians will sit back and say, man, that girl loved that boy. That boy loved that girl. And I know you will be ready to contend with that, but that's not love. When you have true, genuine love for a person, it means to have God's will in your heart for that person, God's intention. So love will make you say, go and be with your wife. Because that is what God wants you to do. So what you have for this man is not love. It is deception. It is mind control. It is um, it's witchcraft. What you have for him is obsession. Uh, what you have for him is lust. What you have for him is idolatry. You made an idol out of that man. And it, it, nine times out of ten, it comes from betrayal, rejection, and things that you've gone through in your life. And he came in and he started filling a lot of voids. These are voids that God wants to fill. He came in and he made you feel better about your life. He made where you felt like... All of the questions that you had did not, didn't necessarily have to be answered because you felt like, well, he was your hero. So that's idolatry. Anytime I come across a person who's in idolatry, it is very hard for, to reach that person. It's very hard for that person to hear. And the reason is, is because that person at that time thinks that they are in love. It's not love. God is love. So anytime we have genuine, true love, I'm talking about agape love, unconditional love, that love will make you release a person. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't love will genuine love will make you release a person. So I want to give you an example. If I'm courting a guy and I really believe without, without a shadow of a doubt that the guy's my God appointed husband and I'm sitting back and I'm like, God, I, you know, I thank you for this guy. And God says, I need you to release him. I, you know, the thing is, even though I can be experiencing, I can have love for this man. Genuine love is going to make me say, amen, sir. Okay, God. I'm going to release him even though it hurts me. So anytime it's not love, it's self-centered. Love is not selfish. Love is not self-seeking. You got to understand, study the Bible when it gives you the definition of love. It's not true love. There is a false love that the enemy has released. And that thing is so strong that most women and most men who get into relationships have been a part of it. They've been deceived by it. So love is not self-seeking. Love is not selfish. So that's not love what you have for him. So like I said, if I was courting a guy and this guy... I, you know, I, this is a godly man and he's everything I've ever want. And God, you know, a God to tell you to do something and he won't necessarily tell you why he just gets you to obey. He, he kind of reminds me of how these Southern parents are. Do what I said. Don't ask me no question. Just do what I told you to do, you know, and that's it. And then eventually later on, God will explain to you why he told you to do something. So God may say, let him go, Tiffany. And I'm sitting there like, God, really, I mean, for real, we talked about marriage, God. God, this man is everything that I've ever wanted. God, this man is, and God says, let him go. If I genuinely love God, then I got to love that man too. If I genuinely love God and I genuinely love that man, I'm going to obey God and release that man. And I go and I'll grieve and God will help me through the grieving process. God will take me through it. He will lead me through it, but he will also bless me because I did that. Now, God may turn around a year later 
and bring that man back and say, okay, you can have him now. And I'm sitting there like, well, you told me to release him. And God's like, no, this is your husband. No, you told me to release him. And God's like, no, this is your husband. I had to work on him. There were some things in him that I needed to break off of him that would have come against. See, I was protecting you. There were some things you didn't understand back then. And I wasn't going to explain it to you because of where you were. But that I was protecting you from some things that were in him. There were some generational curses and mindsets that were still in him that I needed to break off of him. I needed to take him through this. And then at the same time, there was some stuff in you that I needed to break off of you. Because those things would have caused your marriage to become an, an ungodly marriage. It would have been you two godly people coming together and ending up, up, ending up in an ungodly marriage. So God would have said, hey, listen, I was basically protecting you. That's all, baby. I love you. I don't do anything to hurt you but I wanted to protect you and I needed you to do what I said do but because you obeyed me and you went through the grieving process you were willing to be broken for me just like my son was broken for you when he was whipped you were willing to be broken for me listen I wanted to make sure that I really take not only took this man through deliverance but guess what I've done in the process while he was waiting while he was single and while you know after you let him go, I began to enrich him. I empowered him. I gave him wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. A greater level. He's walking in a greater level of authority. This is the gift I give to you. This man, you will never have to worry about anything because I did a lot of work on this one. I did a lot of work because you obeyed me. And also, there are some things in you that you don't even realize I put there. There are some things in you. You won't know that they're there until the time comes for them things to activate. All of a sudden, you're going to see stuff coming out of you. Ideas and things are going to come birthing out of you whenever a problem arises and an enemy comes against your husband something gonna come up in you it's gonna wake up and you're gonna go and blow fire all over that enemy you didn't even know it was there see when y'all was single when you were obeying me i was blessing you i was empowering you i was putting something on the inside of you because you obeyed me because you obeyed me that's what love looks like we got to get to the point where we learn to identify um, love from false love anything god creates the enemy creates a counterfeit y'all got to remember that Anytime the Lord creates something, the enemy creates a, a, a counterfeit. The Bible tells us, behold, Satan does disguise himself as an angel of light. So anytime God creates something, the enemy is going to create something to deceive us with. There is a such thing as false love. And we've all, most of us have been a part of it, especially if sex was involved. Because sex opens the door for um, the ungodly soul tie and idolatry. And when idolatry gets in, it is very hard to minister. And I'm telling you, I've counseled couples. It is very, very hard to minister to a woman who is in idolatry. It is very hard to minister to her because that woman has made that man her everything. I've seen marriages like this. I was a part when I was married the first time I made an idol out of that man. Didn't even know I had made an idol out of him. It wasn't until the end of that marriage when God rebuked me seven, I mean, six years when we were breaking up in the sixth year, our marriage was finalized. Uh, the divorce was finalized in the seventh year. It wasn't until the end of that marriage that God told me that I was in idolatry. It wasn't until the end. That's what I love about him. He will allow you to walk in deception because he has to break a lot of stuff off you before he can give you the revelation. Before he can give you the revelation, it was at the end that he told me that you have you made an idol out of that man. It was at the end that I repented of that. And the minute I let those words go, I repent of that doubt you, Lord. I would never make another man an idol. I would never put another man as an idol in my life. When I let those words go, we broke up that day. When I let those words go, because really what was holding me in that relationship was the fact that I had made an idol out of him, even though we had broken up, I, it, I was so blind that I, I was still in that mindset that I thought that, okay, he'll stop fighting me eventually. He'll stop, you know I mean, the, the choking will stop, the fighting, the attacks, all of this stuff will stop eventually. It'll stop eventually. The cheating, everything will stop eventually. I just got to get him to come to church. I was in deception. That's what deception was. But the minute I sat back, and I said, I repent of that adultery. I would never make a, 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 another person an idol again. God, I would never do that again. I'm sorry for that. When I repented, God delivered me that day. That day I got delivered. So the thing that you got to understand, woman of God, is that right now you're in the strong deception. You have to first come to understand that, hey, listen, regardless of where a man is in his marriage, you can't touch him because he's married. 
Even a freshly divorced man should not be touched. I want every lady out there and every man, a person who is freshly divorced, you don't go after them. Because in God's eyes, in most cases, they are still married. In the court systems of America, they're not married. But in God's eyes, they're still married. And in a lot of cases, even if they're not married because of adultery and they did things the right way, there's still a process. There's still a detox that they have to go through. They got to get detoxed from a lot of stuff. If you get with a man... um who's going through a divorce or who's freshly out of um out of a relationship or for the guys if you get a out, get with a woman who's freshly out of a relationship you are actually entering a, a relationship where you're entering an already established relationship with this person. This woman has certain responsibilities, certain things that she did for him. So that building hasn't come all the way down yet. So what's going to happen is there's an empty seat where she's gone and he's going to place you in that seat. Instead of y'all building something together, you're going to only go to take her place. Now, that may sound like a good thing, but it's not, especially if you said, well, he was a good man and people told me he treated her like a princess says well you got to understand now he's broke heartbroken with her he's mad with her he's angry with her and it's the very same thing like if you deal with a man who has mommy issues his mama did a lot of evil things to him then the thing is until he gets delivered he's living in this building and there's this empty seat and any woman who comes and gets romantically involved with him then he she takes the seat of mommy so what he's going to do is he's going to take her through what he feels like he should have took his mama through. He feels like his mama deserves. And that's why a lot of women end up getting beat by their husbands. That's why a lot of women end up going into these relationships where the guy coming home, wielding a gun, drunk and crying, talking about, I love you. and You did me wrong. And the woman sitting there looking like, dude, I went to work and I came home. What are you talking about? No, I heard you was over there on Fifth Street. You was over there on Fifth Street. And the thing is, that's his mommy issues coming to pass. That building is still open. So you just go and take the seat. So I want you to understand for those of you who are currently dating a married man, get out for the men who are dating a married woman. Get out for the married people who are get dating somebody because you're going through a divorce. In that, there's a process to healing. See, when I got married the second time, I was in strong deception. But God woke me up. Y'all heard my testimony. He woke me up in the first year. It was in the first year that I repented. It was in the first year that I came and I started to acknowledge God. It was the first year because I had already renounced adultery while going through a divorce. I had already renounced adultery. Actually, right before I started going through a divorce with my first husband. So that adultery could not stand in that marriage. See, what happened was the way I got deceived into the marriage was I had made an idol out of myself. See, the first part of idolatry is you make an idol out of yourself. And then you turn around and make an even greater idol out of another person. So I renounced the idolatry with me and men, but I hadn't renounced the idolatry with self. And I didn't realize that. So what God did was in order to, to bring self down, he had to start to break me down. So he allowed that relationship to start to break me down. So within the first year of that marriage, I found myself broken. And God started dealing with me. He started giving me a whole lot of dreams. In that marriage, he started giving me a whole lot of dreams. He started giving me a whole lot of revelation and what he did was he made me have to go to my knees so I got to the point where I had to go to my knees and talk to him I had to go to my knees I needed to talk to him because it was so much warfare with so much going on so I had to go to my knees and then God began to take me all the way on down and he said lay there and let the old girl decompose so I can raise up a new woman lay there lay there when I wanted to get up he said uh -uh, you ain't dead yet lay there lay there and he started taking me through a process. And you can always tell when the old girl's living because she's always, ah, da, da, and screaming and crying. But then he took me through a calm. Even though everything on the inside of me was moving and screaming, I had to go through a calm. I had to go through uh, uh, this process of just dying to myself. And I had to just sit there and allow God to do what he was doing on the inside of me until that girl was no more. And that's why y'all heard me give this testimony that within the first year of that marriage, all of a sudden, I, I, I feel like what I kind of felt like what God did was uh, cruel, but it wasn't. What God did was he took away all of the voids, all everything, the betray the rejection, everything that had led me into the marriage. So now I was sitting in a marriage and I'm sitting there like, I don't even know why I'm here. I'm sitting, I was sitting in a marriage where like, I'm like, well, I don't even know why I'm here. I don't even know what's the purpose of this relationship anymore because now, you know, those voids are no longer there. Everything that I bought him in for has been fixed. So now I got a mechanic and I got a fixed car. So it's like, okay, hold up. God, can I get rid of the mechanic? Because my car, you done gave me a whole brand new car. You done gave me a whole brand new car, so I don't need this mechanic. But, you know, and I'm having to pay him for work that really he doesn't need to do anymore. And God's like, no. And you hired him, so you got to keep paying. 
This is your relationship. And that was really hurt. It was really hurtful because here it was, like I said, I was like a brand new car. And I'm sitting there like, I don't need anything anymore. I'm good. I just want to drive off. I just want to go away. And God said, no. And God allowed me to go into that marriage for five years so he can break other systems down in my life. So he can break things off of me. And so that he can bring me into the, into the arena that he wanted to bring me in. He had to bring me into the warfare arena. He had to, because the things that were on my life and the things that were after me, I had to learn to get into warfare. Because you got to understand that some people come from these generational backgrounds where at some point somebody was playing with demons. And you don't know where in your family could have been your grandma, your great grandma. But at some point, somebody. Somebody was playing with demons. Somebody was in agreement with demons. Somebody went into some outright witchcraft. So some people in their family bloodline, there's some strong, strong witchcraft. So in order for them to get free, they got to die all the way to themselves. Meaning they, they end the generational curse by dying. They, they end it dying to themselves, not dying in uh, the natural, but dying to themselves. So they, they go through that process. And then once you raise back up, those demons still recognize you. They're just like, wait, wait, wait. You still look like the girl. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Nope, 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 nope. Your great, 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 great grandma, your, uh -uh, she was consulting us about your granddaddy. She was doing this and all this other stuff. She was consulting us. So you belong to us. So in order now, because I am a new creature, they are illegal to me. So what God had to do was take me through a process that I'm sitting there dealing with all these spirits around me, no longer in, but that I'm dealing, but I had to learn to open my mouth. I've given the testimony before. There was a time I was married the second time, probably within the second or third year of that marriage, I was laid out on the floor crying like a baby, laid out on the floor crying like a baby, crying into the carpet. And the Lord said, are you finished yet? And what he was letting me know is that I'm not pitying you. I'm not pitying you because I put a sword in your mouth. It's time for you to get up and fight. You can't keep being passive with the enemy. You can't keep on just laying here. You're going to have to get up and fight. You're going to have to. You're not going to be able to just sit here and constantly keep, I'm so tired of this. I'm so tired of people doing me like that. I'm so tired of this. No, I don't want you going back to the spirit of rejection. I don't want you going back to the spirit of abandonment or the spirit of self-pity. I don't want you going back to that stuff. So you're going to have to get up and fight. You're going to have to get up and fight. So I had to literally stand up. I got up off of that floor and I opened my mouth and I, I likened it to fire coming out of my mouth because I had never heard myself pray like that. I was praying, but it was like for me, I was amazed even during the prayer, but there was a righteous indignation in me. And I got up and it was the first time that I just started wielding my sword, my sword against the enemy. And I got up and I went through that house. Devil, I bind you. I was home by myself at that time. Devil, I bind you. I said, fight every demon. And that stuff started. And when it was over with, I couldn't believe that was me. Because God was utilizing something he had placed in me, but he could not activate that thing until the old girl died. Until the old girl died. So I want you to understand, people of God, for every last one of you who are listening to this, pay attention to the deception that you were walking in in relationships. And I want you to understand that the enemy is going to try to return, whether you're delivered or not. He's going to try to return. If you're not delivered, then guess what? He's still there. But if you've been delivered, he's going to try to return. That's what happened to me in 2015. He tried to return. And it feels good. You know, it's a, it's, uh, this, there is a sense of familiarity. And where, where there's familiarity, there's comfort. You know, because where there's comfort, it's just like you feel like you can kind of relax. It's like you get, with a, get around a person and, you know, you kind of feel like you know them. You can kind of relax. Most of the time, you're dealing with a familiar spirit. Now, I'm not saying that every time you get around a person, you're comfortable. It means it's a familiar spirit. But I'm saying if you're walking in deception and you get around people and you, you're comfortable, most of the time, it's a familiar spirit. And you're just like, oh, I know you. Same demon, different person. Oh, I know you. You're cool. I, I know you. I had to get delivered from that stuff. So, woman of God, to the lady who sent this email, um, like I said, I pray you forgive me for doing the message. But believe me, a lot of people need to hear this. You got to stop. You're playing with witchcraft right now. Right now, you, you're, you're not only in rebellion. And you're not only in rebellion, adultery, you're entering witchcraft and your witchcraft has gotten to the point where you're now actually contending with God. God said he hates a divorce, but you're over praying for one so that now you're contending with God. And I tell you, I say this because I love you. I say this not just to you, but for the many women and men out there who are listening. A lot of people who are in institutions right now are there because they started going up against God. I'm going to be honest with you. They got a reprobate mind. They got a reprobate mind. Not everybody in an institution has an, a reprobate mind, so I want to be careful with that. Not everybody in an institution has a reprobate mind. Some people have some strong, some strong demons, and some of them were playing with witchcraft. Some of them have reprobate minds. Some of them, they're there because they need to repent. They're there because they've been playing with witchcraft for a long time. They've been sitting back, 
and they've been, you know, a praying against things that are the will of God. They've been allowing the enemy to use them. I want you to understand there is a reason why devils like to enter bodies. It's because demons, when whatever, without having an earth suit, they have no legal. See, what makes you legal in the earth realm because this is a natural place is that you need to be in a natural body. So they need to get into something that's that's legal that so they can do things legally. Even though their presence is illegal, they can do things legally. That's why they like to enter bodies. Well, so what happens is you got to understand that God God has a system is very much like the legal system in America. As a matter of fact, the legal system of America is a duplicate of, of courtrooms of, of heaven's um, legal system. And what the enemy likes to do is he likes to use legalities for those of you who are in deliverance. Or if you've been on any of the deliverance calls and you've heard a demon speaking out of a person's mouth, you have likely heard a demon say, I got the right to her. I got the right. I'm not coming out. I got the right to her. And then it, then it will go on to proceed to tell you why Deagle, demons like to use legalism. They like to say, hey, listen, I got a right because she's in unforgiveness. I got a right because she's in witchcraft. I got a right to her or what have you. So the thing that you have to understand is that the enemy is, is trying to get you deeper and deeper and deeper. But the more you go, if you don't repent, the more you go, the more you give the enemy access to your mind, not access to the man. Now, because he's not covered nine times out of 10, he needs to give his up to Christ. Nine times out of 10, you are releasing witchcraft against his marriage and that witchcraft probably will be effective. Uh, it will start to destroy his marriage and start to tear it down. But what, what can happen is because if this man has no covering, the, and, but let's say, for example, he's Christian, but he really has no covering because, you know, even though Christ is the head of man, he's not allowed that man. He hasn't allowed Christ to be the head of his life yet. So let's just say that that's the case or what have you. Well, what happens if this man has identified Christ? Then you are the enemy coming in like a flood and the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against you. Meaning God will respond to what you're releasing against that man. God will resp respond and he will judge you right where you stand. He will judge you right where you stand. And what can end up happening is he can turn you over to the tormentors. He can turn you over to a reprobate mind. And what that means is, like I said, you won't even know the right, the difference between right and wrong to be lukewarm. When Jesus said, I will spit you out of my mouth, that means I'm disassociating myself from you. That means it's a picture of deliverance. Y'all heard me say this before. That's a picture of deliverance and deliverance. People spit out, people breathe out and they spit out. When Jesus said, I will spit you out of my mouth. We understand that we are a part of the body of Christ. When he says, I will spit you out, that means you will no longer be a part. You will no longer be in this temple. I will spit you out of my mouth. So I'm, I'm, I'm urging you to repent. I'm urging you to let this man go. I'm urging you to sit back and go through the process. Yes, there's a breaking process. Yes, it hurts when a relationship ends. Yes, it hurts. I understand that it is very similar to death. I understand that I've been through it. I understand it. I was married the first time for seven years, second time for five years. So I understand the process. I understand, but I do also understand that you can get past it. It's all about attitude. It's all about taking a mindset. Well, you know what? I was wrong. That's what I had to tell myself. You, the first time I came out at the wrong way, I jumped into another relationship because I was still operating under a generational curse. But the second time, I was—I mean, I was already ready. God had used that five years. When I tell you he built a warrior in that five years, I tell you he was breaking down that old woman. I tell you he did some things in that five years. By that time, I was ready. That did not stop it from hurting. It still hurt, but I was ready. I was ready for it because I made up my mind. I'm going to go through this. I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to go through the grieving process. I'm going to do whatever research I got to do to help me through the, uh, through the process. I'm going to pray. I'm going to do whatever is necessary. I'm going to cry out to God. I'm going to cry when I need to cry. But I'm not going to stalk this man. Let me tell you what I said. And some of y'all need to hear this. This is what I told myself. I told myself before me and this man broke up, I ain't stalking. I ain't calling. I'm not going around none of his family members. I'm not checking his Facebook page. If he go be with somebody else, I ain't messing with her Facebook page. I'm going to sit here and go through the process and I'm going to cry this stuff out. I'm going to go ahead and deal with these feelings. I'm going to cast down those thoughts that come. I'm, you know, I'm going to do whatever was necessary. So when I was in the process, you know, divorce is very, very hard, very hard, very, they, they liken it to uh, death. But the only thing is, you know, the person is still alive. So uh, for me, for anybody else it's very, very hard. Divorce is never easy so when I was in the process and I had made up my mind to do things the right way because what you're going through is going to feel like a divorce I made up my mind to, to repent of everything I had already repented of the relationship I repented of fornication I was a new creature in Christ Jesus but I made up my mind to go through a process so what I did was during that process I cried to God I wrote notes to God. I prayed to God. I even sat back and, I, you know, talked out loud to God, you know, while praying. Um, I sat back there and I just went through a process with God. And then there was a time I remember where 
I was like, okay, I think I need a notebook. I need to write down some stuff. I need to write down some stuff. I got to, you know, stuff that's in my heart. Like I want to say things I want to do. I need to write it down. I need to pray about it. I need to, I need to see, I'm taking myself through a process. It's called discipline. So I, I went through a process and I went online and I typed in seven stages of grief. And I identified which stage I was in. I said, okay, I got to find out what stage of grief I'm in. I got to go all the way through this process. I ain't going to date nobody. I'm, I'm not going to court because it's adultery. If I'm going through a divorce, I'm not going back to that old thing. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm a new creature. I'm, I'm letting this thing go all the way out. And I allowed that thing to go all the way out. I kept people away from me who will, you know, try to talk about the relationship or people who try to hook you up with somebody. I kept people like that away from me. As a matter of fact, I had got them away from me years before that relationship had ended. So I, I, I was intentional about healing. I was intentional. And I kept telling myself, well, Tiffany, you got about three more months before this thing kind of lifts up where you're no longer, you know, waking up crying or hurting and, 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 and questioning things. You're, you got about three more months for that. And I told myself, so I said, you just got to get through it day after day. Just one day at a time don't jump in your head don't jump in just get up and you make up your mind every day it has to be a fresh thing every day okay today i'm gonna do right i ain't checking i'm not going behind him i'm i'm, I'm leaving matter of fact i'm blocking him on facebook that's what i did i actually blocked my ex-husband for a few months i blocked him while i was going through the process until i got to the process where i could deal i blocked him in I got him off my friends, but I blocked him. And, you know, even though I was communicating with him, I sat back and I made it. He was like, he, he said, you, he asked me, he said, you blocked me. Why? I said, I, I, just, I had to. I had to. And I'm going to tell you something I did. I said, I told him once I decided to take myself through the process, I told him, I got your passwords to this, to this, to this, to this, to this. Go change your passwords. And he was like, what? He came to my house one day because he had to come to my house every month to drop off uh, this you know, his payment, because that's what we agreed to, $400 a month, but uh, for a year. And he would come over, he insisted on coming to, to drop it off or what have you. And every time he came, he would stay an hour or two. And he would just sit up on the couch. And, you know, most of the time I would be at my computer working and I just turn around, spin around and we talk or what have you. But he sat back and he was, um, you know, asking questions and he was saying to me, you know, Tiffany, um, you know, I'm sorry. Why did you do this? And we talked or what have you. And we were just going through a divorce. But anyhow, I, he came to my house one day and I had this uh, note. I had this piece of paper. I handed it to him. He said, what's this? I said, these are the place. I got your passwords to all of these. I've been had your password to all of these things. You need to go change your password. And he was like, okay. And he, he really didn't know what to say because he saw me intentionally trying, like, listen, he had no idea. I had the passwords to a lot of that stuff. He had no idea how I knew, for example, he had a job opportunity. He didn't know how I knew. And I, I, I knew that at that stage that I was in, I knew I was going to keep checking. I knew, see, you got to identify the stage you're in and your vulnerabilities. I identified, I said, if I got his password to this to this email account, if I got his password to this bank account, I ain't going to do nothing. I'm going to get tempted and I'm going to go check. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to fight the temptation, but I'm going to go check. So I said, I got your passwords and then I had to block you on Facebook. So, you know, I'm just taking myself through a process. You just understand. I'm taking myself. I got to go through the process. And he kind of laughed at me because he saw this is a woman who's intentionally trying to get past this stage. She's trying, like she's, she's serious about her healing. She's serious about her forgiveness. I forgave him. And I told y'all before, once I forgave him, God blessed me to be able to lead him through the sinner's prayer. He got saved on my couch while we were going through a divorce. And it got to the point where when we were going through this divorce, we were laughing and talking like we were the best of friends. We were laughing and talking. He did not see any, he saw no bitterness in me because it wasn't there because I renounced that stuff. Even though I knew some of the stuff he did, I knew what he was still doing. There was no bitterness because I came to accept he was never my husband to begin with. I got with him when I was going through a divorce. I did wrong. I accepted it so I can no longer put blame on him because if I put blame on him, I had to take the blame for what I did. I had to take the blame for what I did. So I released this guy. And for the rest of the time while we were going through the divorce, he was bringing a, a monthly payment over for a year, 400 a month for a year. And every month I would see him and he would make sure that he came over. Like I said, he would only come over when he knew he had the time to sit. He would make sure because that was his way of trying to heal. That was his way of trying to go through the process. Like, well, I just want to at least see you and want about once a month and talk to you or what have you. And I didn't say anything because I was over him. I was over him. I was going through a process. And, you know, in the times when I wasn't over him, I told him, I said, hey, listen, I'm going through this. I already know this process. I'm in this stage of the process. So I, I need you to look to do this or what have you. And he laughed. 
and he would just say, he said, you're something, you're something serious. But he said something to me that really, really blessed me. A lot of you don't get this because you don't go through the process. I, he said something to me and he said, don't you let what happened to you change you. He said, because you are a good woman. He said, you were a good wife to me. And I'm sorry I was the type of man that I was. He said, and to be honest with you, he said, you were actually too good for me. A lot of women never get that from a person. And the reason they don't get that is because you're too busy contending. You're too busy practicing witchcraft. You're too busy going crazy. When you you don't understand God is tearing down an idol, you're in false love. It's not real love. It's false love. It's false. False love will make you release a person. See, I, even though I was sitting back and, you know, going through a divorce, God had a genuine love for me and love for God in me. So it was a genuine love in me for my ex. So my desire was his God's will for him. I want him in heaven, regardless of what he do to me, regardless of what he did. I want him in heaven. I want to see him in heaven. Like if we could joke and we were, you know, if we were aware of our presence here in the earth, I would, I would want to joke and say, man, you were something that would do. I remember that time you did this. That's how I want to be. I want to just laugh and say, you know what? That's this because that's true love. True love says, you know what? I release you. True love says, you know what? I want God's will for you. True love says, you know what? I want you blessed. I want you whole. As a matter of fact, I want God to de de deliver you from any, you know, any parts of this marriage. And I want you to be a great man and go and get married again. And I want you to treat her like a princess. And I want you to be the best man that you've ever been to anybody better than you were to me. I want you to be great with her. And, you know, someone would say, that's not fair. I don't want him to go be great with somebody else. And he wouldn't. No, 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 no. Listen, he wasn't mine to begin with. So for the woman that God has assigned him to, I want him to be with her. I want him to treat her like a princess. I want her, him to treat her like a queen. I want him to cover her. I want him to pray over her. I want him to protect her. And then I want to see the two of them in heaven. See, you got to get to that point. You got to get there. You got to get there. But there is a process that has to be taken. There is a journey that has to be made. You got to go through the process. You got to go through the process. It's not going to be easy, but you go through it. You got to be intentional. You got to make up your mind. So, I'm putting myself out there as a template of healing for the people of God to let you know this is where God can bring you, but you got to be willing to go there. You got to be willing. Um, to the woman of God who um, wrote this message, what I want you to do, if you are willing, you need to go through some fasting and some repentance. You got to go through some, and you're going to have to go through deliverance. You're going to have to, and a lot of you out there, not just to her, you're going to go through deliverance. You got to go through deliverance. And if you need deliverance, come on. I'm going to have a conference call Friday. We weren't able to have it last Friday, um, but we're going to have the conference call this coming Friday. And I'm believing God to cast out demons. I'm believing God. But listen, in order to be a candidate, it for, uh, for deliverance. Y'all got to hear me when I say this because there are a lot of people who come, they're not candidates for deliverance, but they want deliverance. And the thing is, when you're not a candidate, most of the time you have your prayer is amiss. You want deliverance for the wrong reason. You're not, you're not willing to repent. You still want to go out there and do the same stuff. You're not a candidate. So you won't even so much as cough or fart. You'll just be on the call or God may take you through a partial deliverance, but he won't take you through a whole deliverance. So I want you to understand if you're coming on this call to get deliverance, you come in with the intention like, look, I'm going to do right. It's not I'm going to try it, that, that you can't have that attitude. I'm going to try. You got I, look, I'm going to do right. I may, I'm not going to say I'm going to be perfect, but man, I didn't made up my mind. I'm not fornicating again. I'm not going out to nobody else's husband. Good, uh, listen, single, I mean, going through a divorce equals married. It's still the same thing as married. Um, freshly divorced. Don't touch that because there's a, the only seat that's open is the seat that has not been, the building is still up. That seat that's still open is the seat that was once occupied by the wife. I realized that when, like I said, the ex reached out to me in 2015, this ex reached out to me and here it is. He's going through a divorce and everything. Listen, the seat that he had open was the wife, the one that the wife had vacated. That's what he had open, which meant that I would have had to come in and take her place, which meant we would have been arguing because he would have been expecting me to cook like her, to think like her, to reason like her, to pick up the responsibilities that she once picked up. Like, for example, if she rent, used to run around and clean the house, that was, that's what he would expect from me. And I'm not against that. I'm just saying. Her responsibilities would have become my responsibilities. That's why I understand why God has had me single. 
for the, the amount of time he's had me single. I've been single since um, my divorce was finalized. We started, uh, we broke up in 2013, the end of 2013. My divorce was finalized in, I think, uh, June of 2014. So it's been um, three years since the divorce. It's been three years since, you know, the divorce. So the thing is, God has had me single in those three years because God had to break, break stuff. Even though I forgave that man a long time ago, there are things sometimes in marriage and, and relationships that we pick up that God delivers us from that we're unaware of if we saw the process we would understand the process but because we don't see the process oftentimes we don't respect it God will take you through a complete and utter like cleansing you out he takes you through and then he has to give you a certain amount of wisdom not just to get away from what you where you were but to take you where you're gonna be like the man that God has assigned to me I gotta have a certain amount of wisdom for this guy because you know what First and foremost, he has to be able to cover me. That, that's the reality. Y'all hear this. When it comes to a man, a man has to be able to effectively cover you. Now, what that means is this. I'll give you an example. I've been praying. I have been praying. Y'all know most of you who follow me. Y'all know I was praying for God to send me to the church home he wanted me to be a part of. And I made up my mind I wasn't going to join a church unless God told me. I made up my mind because some years ago when I went to my first church uh, back in Mississippi, I prayed and God sent me there and I growed. I grew there a lot. I died there a lot. There was a lot. So I came to see the beautiful process. You know, like when God puts you somewhere, it's a place where you need to be. It was, uh, you know, it was great. It was peaceful. Then at the same time, it was a, a lot of things where he was breaking off of me. And I saw a change in myself over those years. I saw me growing. If you're in the wrong church, you're not going to grow. If you just go into a church because your family go there, you're not going to grow very much because God is intentional. It's very much like choosing a school. I can't take my third, uh, let's say if I had a third grader and say, hey, baby girl, where you want to go? What grade you want to be in? And she points to this. I want to go over here. And she go over there and she chooses a kindergarten because it's fun and it doesn't challenge her. And she goes over there and she goes back to kindergarten. And I'm wondering why my baby is, is delayed and she's not talking like most people who are eight years old. So she can't choose that. She has to go to the grade according to the level that she's on. And even though she's going to be uncomfortable, she's learning. That's when you, That's what learning looks like learning is uncomfortable it's not that you're sitting there excited so I prayed and I asked the Lord to send me to the church home that he wanted me to go to I asked him to send me to the church and God sent me here to a church called Embassy Embassy International for those of you in the Atlanta area make sure you come out awesome church that's where God sent me it's on 325 Fulton Industrial Boulevard for those of you who want to look it up but that's where God sent me so that I could learn so the thing is it's a process that God takes you through and as you're going through the process it's like a lot of things you don't think you need you're gonna need so God starts to prepare you there's a certain amount of wisdom so it, the point is he sent me there I went to many churches and visited and I'm gonna be honest with you some of them could not cover me and I recognized that let me tell you how I recognized it because what they were teaching I already knew what they were teaching, I already knew. I realized that I was in class and I'm sitting here and I'm like, okay, I already know about Noah's Ark and Abraham and all that other stuff. You know, we, we go back through the lessons, but I need some revelation. I need some deep, some debt or what have you. People were recommending churches to me and I would go online and look and I'm like, nah, that ain't for me. That's not for me. You know, I ain't got no problem with the minister, but that's not for me because, you know, they're on, they're on a different level. You know, like they're, 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 they're too far there, you know. I knew, I knew what I needed. I knew I needed to be taught. I didn't want to just go to church and be comfortable just to sit in the congregation and wither away. I didn't want that. I wanted to go where God was going to stretch me. I wanted to go where God was going to challenge me because I knew that God wanted to do something in my life. And I know growth is not comfortable, but hey, listen, it's necessary. So I made up my mind and I waited until God told me this is your church. And I went and joined. Because I was intentional. And the, the point is, my pastor can cover me. He can cover me. So the thing is, I can go there and learn. And I've been learning and I've been being stretched and what have you. He, I, he can cover me. And the same thing that is going to have to happen in relationships. Not every man can cover you. Ladies, y'all got to hear this. And men, you got to hear this. You can't cover every woman. Some of you guys will go after a woman who has a greater calling on her life than you do and that woman is walking in some serious authority and you looking at the fact that she 
uh, pretty and she fine in you or what have you, but you don't have the wisdom to cover her. You got to be able to fight certain demons. You know, y'all got to understand this. There are certain types because of the level that she's walking in. There are certain things that you're going to have to fight off of her. Otherwise, she's going to be in that fight alone. And you're going to wonder why she's frustrated with you. You're going to wonder why you sitting there like, hey, listen. You know, it's like I'm trying to be a good husband and all this other stuff. Because this girl is having to fight some serious demons. And you over here and you lackadaisical about it. So you got to understand, woman of God, you got to be intentional. Because even if you feel like you're not that deep in Christ Jesus, you don't know how deep God has rooted you. And you're just having to grow out of the ground. You don't know how deep God has rooted you. So the husband that he has for you has to be able to cover you at your greatest height. He has to be able to cover you. If he's not able to cover you, then what's going to happen is you're going to grow past him. And that's when people start saying things like we grew apart. And that's the truth. People do grow apart because the man can't cover the woman. The woman can't, you know, and then a lot of times the man has to stunt your growth in order for a relationship to work. And now I'm going to tell you something. If your, 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 your growth is stunted, you're going to find yourself frustrated. Because then, here it is, it's like you got deep roots, but you're not that deep in the air. So you're not going, you haven't gone that far into the air. You're not, you haven't raised up and you're going to feel the pressure of being suppressed and oppressed. You're going to feel the pressure and you're going to recognize where it's coming from. You're going to recognize that there are opportunities available for you, but you can't have them because of him. And you're going to become frustrated with the man because of that. That's why it is necessary for you to go through a process. It is necessary for you to get the healing you need, the deliverance you need, for you to get into the word of God and to get to know the heart of God all the more. It is necessary. That way, when the right man comes along, he can properly cover you at your greatest height. As a matter of fact, I want you to think of a potted plant. I wrote an article one time, and I was dealing with a potted, uh, the potted plant. If I take a certain um, tree and I put it into a, a a pot that tree cannot grow very much because it can't root itself very deeply in that pot now if i take that tree and i put it outside and i root it in the ground that thing can grow up to its maximum height that's why you have certain trees that you can actually put into pots or what have you and you know what well, they're not going to grow very far and the reality is is because it can't root very deeply um the same thing goes with certain types of fish you can put a fish in an aquarium and certain fish cannot grow to a certain height or a, you know they can't grow to a certain with or what have you because the aquarium is so small and they wouldn't have room to, to, to swim and so God made it he built something within them that if they're in this small space that they won't grow very much they won't grow that I want you to understand it's the same thing with you you can actually be in a relationship where you really can't grow very much you know, or if God does start to grow you, you're going to become frustrated. You're going to feel suffocated. You're going to start feeling. And I, I felt that pressure when I was in the second marriage because God killed that flesh in the second year. But I was married. I mean, excuse me, in the first year, he killed that flesh. I was repented in the first year, but I was married to the man for five years. So I went through um, four, four years of frustration. Four years of frustration, four years of feeling potted, feeling constricted, four years of feeling like, OK, something got to break soon. Something got to give soon. I went through that for four years, and I got to tell you, it's not a great feeling. It's not a good feeling at all. It's going to frustrate you. As a matter of fact, during those four years, I had to do a lot of praying. One of the prayers I had to often pray was, Lord, help me to respect my husband. That was a prayer that I had to be intentional about because the thing is, you respect the people that can cover you. Now, you have a certain level of respect for, like, I can have a certain level of respect for a friend or somebody who is, um, somebody, for example, who spiritually speaking isn't necessarily where I am. I can have, there's a certain amount of respect. But when it comes to a, a leader, that you got to have, there's a certain level of respect that you need to have for a leader. So here it is. God had already dealt with me. He said, you got to submit to this man. This is the head of the home. You got to submit to him. So I had to pray and say, God, I'm going to need help with this because he couldn't cover me. I said, God, I need your help with this because he can't cover me. He don't know how to lead me. He's not even in you. How can I, I, how can I respect him? It's very hard. So I had to become very intentional. Whereas a woman who's married to the right man, respect comes naturally. So it's not even a problem in a marriage, meaning everything else flows naturally. But when you're in that type of relationship, nothing flows naturally because your relationship is unequally yoked. So what had to happen was, I, here it is. I'm like an ox with oxen. You know, you, you, you always use the example of ox. You know, if you yoked up with a donkey or what have you and not saying that he's a donkey or I'm a donkey, but what I am saying, is this is that I want you to see the illustration like you have to kind of pull your head down and walk real low so that you don't strangle the the the, the, the you don't strangle the mule and then the mule has to sit there and try to keep up with you so it, it becomes a strained relationship and that's what happened for four years it was a strain but I had to pray I had to pray every day I had to pray and say God I, okay I'm gonna need you again today 
You did it yesterday. I'm going to need you again. I need a fresh helping. I need a fresh helping. It is very hard. So that's what those type of relationships look like. So um, y'all be very careful about deception and relationships. I want you to understand that your parents may have walked in a certain line of deception. And if they did, you may have to go through deliverance from the spirits that came in because those same seducing spirits will seduce you into the lies that they were once bound by. So you got to break that stuff off of you. You got to renounce that stuff. And then you got to be intentional about walking in Christ Jesus. You got to make up your mind that, listen, I'm going to do this thing the right way. I'm not going to continue to go down this path, even though this path is comfortable for me, even though is familiar with um, to me or what have you even though i know for example if i got with him a dude would marry me just like that and he got a good job and i know he's the type of man who'd be faithful well the, the question is can he cover you because there are a lot of women who are married to men who have great jobs and the man is faithful to him and the woman has no respect for him because the man can't cover her and she's frustrated because she's like a potted plant or a fish in a, a small aquarium she can't really grow and she doesn't understand her frustration. She's just frustrated because she chose a man when she was at a small height. I want you to think of it this way. And then we're going to close after this. I want you to think of it this way. We know that most children, uh, most girls stop growing um, around the time when they're 16. Um, between the ages of 13 and 16, most girls stop growing. And I think the maximum age, of course, is 18. Um, you can still grow all the way up until you're 18. I may be wrong, but we're just going to use that for example's sake. So, you know, back in the day, um, a lot of parents used to allow their children to marry when they were young. They would allow a 12 or a 13-year-old girl to get married, especially if she was sec sexually active. So I want you to uh, imagine that... This 13-year-old girl had no parents, or she wouldn't listen to her parents. And she was out there being wild. And she came across this boy, and she wanted to be with him so bad. You know, she's just like, I want him so bad. And this dude is 16 years old, and her parents are saying, listen, you too young, he too old for you, you got to listen to me. She's like, nah, I'm in love with him. And we're going to put her at the age of 12 or 13 years old. No, I'm in love with him. Y'all don't understand. And she rebels against her parents, and her parents finally say, you know what, you can have him. You going out here. Now, she's not finished growing yet. And let's say that this guy's about um, five foot three or five foot three, five foot four tall. Now, all of a sudden, she continues to grow. Now, at the, you know, this stage, she was five foot two. She continues to grow. Let's say this girl gets to about uh, five foot eight tall. And now her husband or this guy that she chose for herself is a lot shorter than her. And it's, it's bothering her because it's embarrassing her. She's still young. You know, she wants somebody that, you know, that she, she can look up to. You know, she don't want somebody that she got to keep looking down to. She kind of feel like she got to pick him up and carry him like a toddler around with her. She doesn't like that. So now she gets to a stage where, and it's only natural for her to go to that stage where she starts seeing guys, you know, and it's like, wow. And this guy walks up to her one day and this, you know, this guy's like six foot two and he kind of looks down to her and he goes to talking and she said, man. That's what I want right there. Do you see in her in her time when she wasn't when she was still short and she was still young in her immaturity, she chose somebody not realizing that she was going to grow some more, not realizing that at some point she was going to want somebody that she can look up to. It's only natural for women to want a man that they can look up to. That's why we have memes coming up on Facebook that, you know, people show like a woman with a short guy. And most people are saying, no, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. It's only natural for us to want somebody that we can look up to. I'm a short woman. I remember when I was younger um, and I was dating a guy. And I had never dated a short guy, but I dated a guy who was pretty much my height, just a little bit taller, just not even not even noticeably taller. And it bothered me so badly because I didn't want nobody that short. It's only natural for a woman to want a man that she can look up to. It's only natural, even for a woman who's six feet tall, she wants a man that she can, she wants to at least match his eyes or look up to him. That is, it's only natural for us. Do you understand that that's a representation of what goes on in the spirit? We need somebody that we can look up to. We need somebody who can cover us. We need somebody that we can sit back and, and submit to. We need that, but it's very hard. So this girl is now with this guy and she's taller than him and he's walking, uh, you know, his head is over here by her shoulders or what have you. And now she has no respect. So now she got to constantly keep praying because she didn't marry the dude. She got to constantly keep praying. God, I need help respecting him. I need help respecting him because he's so short. You know, we get into an argument. I feel like I, I feel like I can take him. I feel like I can punch him out. See, now you got to be careful with that kind of stuff because those feelings will start coming in. Man, I feel like I can knock his little tail out. Dude, you better go. I'm trying to tell you. I'm going to pick you up and throw you in the washing machine. You better go. So you can start feeling like that. So now in her marriage, she's frustrated. And now she starts going out here and she's with, you know, her husband and stuff. And he walking around. Hey, hey. And then, you know, and he's a midget to her. 
and her friends all waited till they were grown. And they got men that are taller than them. And they all looking up and they all slow dancing. Let's say they go to a reception, everybody slow dancing. And now her husband, he got his head leaning on her breast and everything. And she feel like she's slow dancing with a little boy. The issue is she wait, she didn't wait until she matured. And that's what happens to a lot of Christian women. You wait, you want to get into a relationship when you're not yet spiritually mature. And then because of that, you end up with somebody who's shorter than you in the spirit. And now you have trouble respecting him. Once you get into that marriage, you have trouble respecting him. So if you want to continue to respect the man, the thing is you got to let God mature you so that a mature man can come after you, a man who can cover you, a man who can teach you, a man who can lead you, somebody who can protect and provide for you, somebody that you don't mind submitting to. Because there's something, y'all ladies hear me on this, y'all y'all know this truth. There's something, for example, about a man who's taller and he walks up to you and he has a very heavy voice, makes you want to submit. It's, it makes you want to submit. Now, you turn around and get somebody who's short and he got that little, um, that little, that little squeaky voice. Hey, yeah. Okay, right then and there, you got to struggle to, uh, to, to respect him. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. You have trouble submitting to him because his voice is too womanly or too fe female, too feminine. Um, also, too, we, you know, I noticed like in the Georgia area, there are a lot of men who are kind of, you know, a little on the feminine side. You know, and I, I, I know, you know, we've seen them in Mississippi, too. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're gay, but a lot of times they were raised by a grandparent or something may have happened or what have you. But a lot of them. But a man like that, you have trouble. As women, we have trouble respecting them. We have trouble because we associate, there's a certain level of authority we associate with a man. You better come with it. You better, look, we want to hear a, a deep voice. If you ain't got a deep voice, you better have some wisdom. You better be able to come out here and you better be dropping some wisdom. Other than that, it is hard for us to respect. So that's why you want, you want to wait for God to mature you. So that way, when you mature, you're not with somebody that is immature. The minute you find yourself and you didn't got to a mature state that you look down at the man that you chose for yourself and you end up frustrated and you want to take him back and say, God, listen, um, Either you grow him up or you give me somebody else. And God's like, nope, you're going to have to deal with your spiritual midget. You're going to have to continue to keep walking with him. So y'all be very careful as to the relationships you're jumping into. The thing that I tell you, and I want you to hear my heart. Like I said, God's been doing something amazing with this generation. He's been breaking some stuff off of a lot of you. He's been getting you to renounce generational curses. Some of you are closing doors on those family members that God has told you to close doors on. You are doing some amazing things. You're not just checking out relationship messages. You are checking out messages about how to cast out a demon because you realize when your, your husband come home, you might have to cast a demon out of him at some point. You learn and stuff like like that and God is rewarding you he's preparing you and you are Esther and you'll be a massage with the oil you're being massaged with the oil before you go before the king. And you ain't sitting there trying to take a bunch of foolish stuff. Y'all y'all studied how Esther's life. Esther didn't sit up there and say, "Okay, I want you to put some extra extensions in my hair. I want you to, not -uh, because he got all those women that's been going to him. Man, I'm telling you, I want to be the baddest one. Esther wasn't doing it. You know what Esther did? She asked for wise counsel. She asked for wise counsel. So the thing is, she and she was getting massaged with the oils, and she asked the eunuch. She said, hey, what should I take? She asked advice, and you know what she did? She won favor with the eunuch because all the other ones was basically trying to tell. They trying to act like they know the king. Now, here the eunuch is. He know the king. He know him because he's been working with him. He know the king. And all these women, they trying to use all their devices and stuff like that. Okay, I want I, I want you to I want to make sure the girls are perked up real good. I want to make sure this and all that. And they go before the king, and they become nothing but a concubine to the king. Because I want you to understand what they did was they went into the king's chambers. And then after they left the chambers, they had to go into the concubine concubine room whether or not the king slept with him or not they went into the concubine room because the eunuch could not ask hey did you sleep with the king you know what have you that that wasn't his business so they went into the concubine room and i want you to understand kings would have sometimes hundreds and thousands of concubines some of them had never even slept with the king some of them had never they were just sitting in there and then they would have their own rooms and they would just sit there and some of them died virgins some of them died only having slept with the king once some of them died not even having kids because the king would only go back to the women in which he favored you, you got to understand he's got all these hundreds of women they're only 365 days in a year he wasn't going down the hallway saying any many mighty mo he was doing like a, a most men would do. He would sit back and some woman come up in his mind, man. Last time I was in there was such and such. Who that girl made me feel some kind of way. 
So he continued to go, go back to her room and he would probably have out of those hundreds, he would probably have like 10 women that he favored and he would go and see them. But Esther, wanted, she understood she wasn't applying to be a concubine. She was applying to be a queen. All these other ones, they came, they applied to be a queen, but they acted like a concubine. Hey, show me, uh-uh. What, what, y'all got some push-ups and stuff like that? What, 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 what we gonna do? Uh-uh. Put me some of that oil over there. Uh-uh. I want to take that in the room with me. I want some. Give me some of that. They acted like a concubine, and the king treated them like a concubine. But Esther sought wise counsel. That's why I love wisdom. That's why I chase wisdom because I see what wisdom did for, for Solomon. I see what wisdom did for Esther. I see what wisdom did for David whenever David wasn't acting silly. I see what wisdom did for Abraham. I see what wisdom did. So the thing is, I ask for wisdom. I don't chase all that other stuff. I don't chase material things. I chase wisdom. I chase wisdom because wisdom done some great things for some great people. And wisdom calls some people to become great. So Esther, here she is, and she asked the eunuch, the one who's closest to the king, the one the other ones probably didn't even think to respect. Because they looking at the fact that he ain't, you know, he a eunuch, he ain't got no penis. You know, it, it's not like he the king's advisor or what have you. So they didn't respect him, not realizing he close to the king. He close. Look, you need to ask him. Ask wise counsel. She asked wise counsel, and she won favor with that eunuch. She won favor, and I want you to understand that that favor with that eunuch went a long way. The Bible doesn't tell us what the eunuch did, but I'm sure the eunuch probably went into the king's ear and said, man, this one here, I like to probably gave him a wink or did something. And you just let him know when Esther went in and he leading Esther into the room, probably looked at the king and winked or gave him, you know, this look of approval or, or what have you. Because we know that men do this. Men do that. They will give a man a look of, appro of approval or thumbs up or what have you. She won favor with the one who appeared to have no power because she was a wise woman. She said, hey, what, what should I take? Meaning, I'm involving you in this. Hey, what should I tell you? What do you think? What do you think? And then, you know, she won favor with him, and she won favor with the king. And the king put a crown upon her head. He put the crown, the crown of, uh, of a queen. And not only did he do that, not only did he do that, he continued, even after she became the queen, to listen to her. That's why some of y'all get married and your husband don't respect you because you were too busy acting like a concubine. And there's a thing you got to understand that with every person, including men, when you walk at a certain level, they talk to you according to the level that they see you on, not necessarily the level that you see yourself on, but the level they see you on. That's why some women get mad talking about something. He treat me like a hoe because you act like one. You, you were acting like one, so he treat you like how you act. Now, you may see yourself as a, as a business woman, all professional and, and real smart and all that. You may see yourself like that, but he sees an arrogant woman who is just out there. He sees you completely different. So... Esther used wisdom. She asked for wise counsel. And then even after that, he still respected her as a queen. When she went before him, she went before him in an in illegal way. She was supposed to be summoned, but she went into his courts. See, y'all gotta understand, this is how we can do with the king of kings. She went into his courts, guys, and he lifted up the scepter to say it is okay. But then she still had the wisdom to bow down and say, here's my petition. And he said to her, what, what do you want? Even all the way up to half of the kingdom I will give to you. And y'all, some of y'all over here with dudes that can't even give you a, a potato chip, can't even give you a room in a house, can't give you nothing. He can't even afford to buy a hotel for y'all to stay in. He can't afford nothing or rent a hotel for y'all to stay in. He can't even rent a box for y'all to stay in. They ain't even got the money to get a car. And this man saying, all the way up to half of the kingdom I will give you. Y'all can chase foolishness if you want. You better chase, you better chase wisdom. Wisdom will take you before the king. And then wisdom will help you to still have his love and his respect, even when you're married to him. But you got to stay submissive in the midst of it. Now, back to this message. Guys, you got to understand, like I said, there's a lot of deception that the enemy is using um, with women of God and men of God to get you into illegal relationships so that he can start to consume the both of you. You got to get to the point where you say, you know what? I'm going to walk this thing all the way out and I'm just going to trust God and I'm going to let God do what he's going to do because he is God alone. Even though I don't understand it, I ain't going to question it. I'm just going to let God be God. He will explain it in due time. But right now, I'm just going to trust him. I'm going to blindly follow him because he says walk by faith and not by sight. I'm just going to trust that he's leading me into a good place because he's a good God and he, there is no evil in him. As a matter of fact, he can't even do anything evil. As a matter of fact, he can't even tell a lie. So I'm going to follow him and I'm going to trust him even though I don't see where he's taking me. I'm going to trust him and I'm going to be led by him and I'm going to keep on going and keep on going until he finally taps me on the shoulders and says hey look and when he says look I can lift up my eyes and see the glory of what he's done in my life I, I made up my mind guys I said you know what 
Even though I lived a defeated life at one point, don't mean I got to keep on doing it. See, some of you, you've been living a defeated life and you resolved yourself to that. I made up my mind. I said, I ain't got to keep doing this. I ain't got to keep on going in this direction. I can do something different. I made up my mind. I decided to die to myself. I decided to say, you know what, God, I'm going to follow you, even though I don't understand where you're taking me, even though a lot of stuff don't necessarily make sense to me. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to trust you. And I continued to follow God. I continued to follow him. I, fo I followed his instructions. I followed his wisdom. I followed him and I followed him and I followed him, even though I didn't see where he was taking me, even though there were times where I thought, okay, any day now he's going to tap me on the shoulders. And then a whole year later, he still hadn't tapped me on my shoulders and I'm still blindly following him. But in the midst of it, I see the blessings. I see the things that he's done. And I can honestly say I've seen a lot of um, advancement. He broke that. I mean, he took that old girl that I used to be. He took her all the way out. He took her all the way out. So whatever he's doing in me now is what's, what needs to be done. Not just for me, but for my family. You know, not just for me, but for um, not just my natural family, but for my spiritual family. As for those of you, whatever he's doing in me, I have to trust him. Because he's doing something for a greater... See, I can get caught up on the whole marriage thing if I wanted to, but I choose not to. I can get caught up on what most people see, but I know God has a greater vision. So I have to follow his vision. I got to follow what he's doing in my life because I understand that I can get caught up in my own flesh and say, okay, I just want to be married and I want to have kids. You know, I'm turning 40 in August and all this other stuff. I can get caught up in that. But God says, no, there's greater in you, and I want to pull it out of you. And I, I, I made up my mind to go and follow God. I made up my mind to forsake being in a relationship for the sake of, of following God. doesn't mean I don't want to get married. It does mean that, listen, I'm a woman. I know that I can jump into a relationship, but I decided to trust God. I decided to say, you know what, God, I'm leaving this up to you. You pick the husband for me. I'm just going to get out your way. I'm just going to go and serve you where you want me to go. What church you want me to go to? Okay. And like I told y'all, he sent me to a church where I can learn, where my pastor is wiser than me. So he can impart wisdom and I can learn so I can sit there. It's the same thing that happens in a marriage. My husband has to be wiser. He's going to be wiser, meaning I can sit and I can submit and I can learn. And it's not a struggle. Some of y'all are with guys right now that you castrate and you over there with that Jezebel spirit because that, and that's how the Jezebel spirit likes to get into women. Let me go ahead and blast that real quick before we close. That's how the Jezebel spirit likes to get into women, get into, get you into a relationship with somebody who cannot properly cover you. And then next thing you know, you take control of that relationship and Jezebel moves in. And now you over there constantly castrating the dude. That's what the enemy loves to do with women is to get you into a relationship where you get so caught up in what you see. And then you get so caught up in what you imagine that you don't face the truth, that you just basically ignore the truth. So you keep dragging this dude to church trying to get him um, to get the demons cast out of him. You keep dragging him to church trying to get him to change. And God is saying, no, that's not what I want. You know, I want him to change for me. There is a direction that he's going to go in that does not match the man that you've imagined. So you're going to have to let this man go. A lot of you are in relationships right now where you're having to lead the guy. You're taking him to church. You're trying to get him saved. You're trying to get him to rededicate his life to Christ. And you are out of order. You are actually being deceived by what's called the Jezebel spirit and it's to get you so you can get into this relationship and you can castrate the dude you can castrate him and this is coming from your rejection and your voice this is why it is necessary for you to stay single for um the seasons that god wants you to be single so he can heal you when god made me single or god took me through and he allowed me to go through the divorce and everything what god did was he started healing a lot of things in me that i didn't even know that needed to be healed Stuff from you know, that, that came way before that marriage. He started taking me through a process. It's called a readying process. So the oil, he's massaging the oil right now. Some of y'all being massaged with the oil and you can feel the frustration and you can feel the, the pleasure of the, the oil being massaged and you can feel the frustration, the tension as it leaves. You can feel all that. You're being massaged. You're being, you're being prepared for the king. But then some of you, if you get into rebellion, like I said, you're going to easily run into witchcraft, honestly. You go into rebellion, it is a system. It is a process. I actually tell men, I warn men. I say, listen, the enemy will get a woman with you, get her into our downtrend. and you'll be flattered. Like, man, this girl, I'm like her everything. You'll be flattered. But you, you ain't going to be flattered long because at some point, you're going to come to realize she ain't the woman for you. And no matter what you do, you ain't going to be able to shake that. At some point, you're going to realize she's not, you know, it's like, listen, um, I can't really talk to her about certain things. I can't do. And you're going to get to that point, And then eventually, you're going to pull away. And I'm going to tell you, because she's in idolatry, sister girl going to go into a realm of insanity. And she's going to go start playing with witchcraft. And I warned men. I said, she's going to start playing with it. 
She'll go to a witch that you know and sit up there and start talking to that woman, or a witch describes uh, the, the that that's disguising herself as a pastor, and that woman be like, "Hey, what he, what he did, mm -mm, girl? Because these men ain't no good. I tell you, I, girl, uh, uh, you know what? We gonna pray." And that witch start doing witchcraft, and next thing you you over there struggling with some stuff, and you trying to figure out what's going on. You know what? You ain't never watched porn a day in your life, but you being tempted because the enemy's trying to swallow you up. Because these people are releasing things into your life because some woman who made an idol out of you is now angry. And now she's angry. And to the woman of God who sent this message, I love you, sister, but I want you to come on Friday's conference call. But before you come on, make sure you go through, um, I would say, to fast. I, you got to write yourself a note, write God a note. You need to repent and say, God, I will not repent. Means you're saying I won't do it again. It, mean, it doesn't mean to apologize for doing it. It means to agree that what I did was wrong. I'm not only apologizing for doing it, but I'm agreeing to never do it again. And then I'm also agreeing to take your attitude towards that thing. So you got to take God's attitude when it, in relation to witchcraft. You cannot pray for somebody's marriage to fail. That is witchcraft. You cannot pray against the will of another human being. That is witchcraft. If a man says, I don't want to be with you, then that is witchcraft. So Another thing that I want to say to the young lady is this, you need to stop him from calling you. You need to change your number. Um, when it comes to relationships, um, I have a rule and this rule has blessed me. And some of you have this same rule it's blessed you. So I want to share this with you. When it comes to a relationship, once a relationship ends, it ends. There's an X across it for me. There, in no, there are no connections. There are, there is no, you can call me. I don't do that. I don't believe in that because it won't, that, that does not allow you to heal because sometimes with a guy, a guy will lead you. If he says, can we still be friends? He's really saying, I want to keep the door open between the two of us because I want the, the ability to call you if things don't work out here. Or if, you know, I get frustrated or something like that. Basically, I want to make you a concubine. I want to make you a side chick. I want to put you in a chamber. I may come back into you a couple of times, but I may not. And then you just become one of the concubines like the king. Like I said, he would have certain concubines he would visit and certain ones that he would not. You become a concubine that he's willing to visit from time to time. And I, I made up my mind a long time ago. I don't want to be that. I made up my mind. So did when I was going through a divorce, I'll be honest with you, when I was going through a um, divorce the first time, I knew he was going to want to stay in touch with me. I knew that. I mean, it was, it was that we were married for seven years. And before we got married, we were together for two years. So the thing was, I knew that, hey, listen, He's going to want to stay in touch. We broke up in the sixth year. It was finalized in the seventh year. Let me say that. So we, we were together about nine years. So the thing was, I knew, even his conversation, I knew he wasn't going to want to let go. I knew what he was doing. He was doing a thing and I call repositioning. Basically where, especially when there's another woman involved, she becomes the main, main chick and you become the side chick. And I knew basically he was just trying to say, hey, listen, can you be my side chick? You know, I want to go over here and I want to explore this and I want to do this and all, but I just, I want you to be my side chick. I want to be able to call you from time to time and I want to make sure that no other man come get you now because I ain't with that because you mine and it, men are territorial creatures. So I, I heard what he was saying and not necessarily what I wanted to hear and I said no and I ended it and I shut off all communication. As a matter of fact, I changed my phone number. I changed everything. I had a restraining order. I got complete, like I took control of my space. I said no. And I allowed myself to go through the healing. Even though I wasn't over him, I went through the healing in that. When I went through a divorce a second time, before we uh, broke up, my ex sat down and had a conversation with me. And I expected the conversation because I'm a woman and I know how men are. You know, especially if the man is broken. I don't want to say men because I don't want to generalize. But I'm talking about if a man is not saved. I know men are territorial. So I knew we were going to have that conversation. So he said, hey, can we still be friends? And he said, well, I, no, at first he said, he didn't say that at first. At first he said, I don't want a divorce. I'm not sure about that right now. So what I want us to do, he said, um, can I go, you know, I've already uh, looked at some places and everything and I want to go and just move into a place and, you know, to another state and everything. And I'll be gone for six months. I'll help you out with some of the bills and everything. And, you know, so you have time to kind of clear your head and I have time to clear my head. And I told him no. And there's a reason I said no. Y'all heard me talk about this before. I said no, because I understood what he was asking me. I understood. See, I'm not, I'm no fool. I'm not, I'm not a child. You, you get grown, you stop lying to yourself. You can sit there and deceive yourself all day long. Oh, he really wants to be with me. No, 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 no. I, I, I sat back. I made up my mind a long time ago to be real with myself because you can't deceive yourself to be real with myself. And I understood what he was saying. I understood he was saying, can I go over here and explore uh, this other woman and be with her for six months and I'm going to live in another state and I don't want you to know where I'm living or nothing like that. And I just want to go over here and try this out. And in the six months, I'll come and let you know whether or not I want to be with you. I heard that. That's what I heard. Can
can I go and explore something else? And let me, can let me go and live a completely different life? And let me see if you so desperate or what have you, if you willing to sit there and wait on me? And I said no to it. So we went ahead and started going through a divorce not long after that. Then when we were going through a divorce, I think it was around the time right before the divorce finalized because, you know, um, I said he was bringing, um, we had agreed to $400 a month for 12 months to catch up on his end of the bills, you know, or what have you. So he was bringing that money over. And then once he realized that it was about to end, he once he realized, like, listen, and, I, you know, he was like, do you need it? I can still help. And I said, no, I don't want, you know, I don't want any more help. God's got me. As a matter of fact, I actually even regretted taking that. Um, it wasn't taken. It was an agreement or what have you. Y'all heard the story before. Um, the enemy made sure that I found out he was making a whole lot more money. And the enemy started tempting me to go for more money. And I said, no, um, I was actually about to do it. And I prayed to the Lord and I said, Lord, what, I, what should I do? And the Lord said, if you go against this man's will, it is called witchcraft. He said, ask him if he's willing, because we had agreed. That's what he was saying. I could afford to give 400 a month. We had agreed to that. But here it was. I found out he was making three times more money uh, as you know, more money than he had told me. And the enemy was just, you know, all in my ear. Like, look, he was doing this a whole marriage. He was making all this money all that time. He was hiding money. Obviously he was taking care of somewhere else. He was doing this. So the enemy was in my ear and I allowed myself to get in my flesh for a minute. And I started crying and typing up this note and I'm typing up this note, you know, to his lawyer. Cause the lawyer told me, she said, just go and tell me what you want. And you bring it back to me and what have you. And uh, I said that I was just typing up this note and I'm frustrated and I'm typing up this note. And then I sat there and I was like, wait a minute. After I printed it off, I'll never forget. I printed it off, put on my shoes, get it ready to go. Go to the bank to have it notarized so I can take it to the lawyer. And I stopped in my tracks and I realized, Tip, you and your flesh. I realized right then, you and your flesh, and you're about to make a mistake. If you want God to protect you and to cover you and to provide for you, you better ask the counsel of the Lord. And I stopped right there in my tracks, and I said, God, what should I do? I said, and I was honest, I said, I'm hurting, I'm angry. God, I'm hurting, I'm angry. And I said, I found out he's lying, he was lying. And I'm just in there crying and talking to God. And I heard God so clearly say, he said, Ask him if he's willing to give more. He said, because if you try to force him to give more, it's witchcraft. He's agreed. That was his number. He said, can I do 400 a month? And, you know, for 12 months or what have you. And here the enemy was, no, nah, girl, all that money he's making, you can get $1,500 a month. And you need to ask for probably 24 to 48 months or what have you. And I'm sitting there. But I stopped in my tracks and I realized where I was. I was like, Tiff, you're about to make a mistake. You're about to end there. You look, you're about to make a mistake and this is going to affect you. So I stopped and I asked the Lord and the Lord said, if you force him to do anything he does not want to do, it is called witchcraft. You are coming against his own will. I don't even come against a person's will. I let people do what they want and I judge them accordingly. So he said, don't do that. So he said, you call him and you ask him. Is he willing to do more? And if he says no, let it go. And I called him and I said, hey, are you willing to do more, you know, in light of all this other stuff? And he was like, Tiff, you know, I'm sorry. I know I was lying to you, but, um, you know, honestly, that's all I could afford. And he went on and on. And, I, you know, I just sat there and I felt this peace. And I said, you know what? Don't even worry about it. And he was like, what? And it shocked him because I had him. I could have got him. I had him. And he, it shocked him. He said, what? I said, don't you worry about it. He just, he, it, it shocked him so much. He kept talking. He was like, because Tiff, you know, I got my money going to 401k and I knew it was a lie. Nobody got that much money going into 401k. But I was like, I said, no, no, you're fine. And he was like, and he kept talking. I said, no, you're fine. Don't even worry about it. I want to give you this testimony, guys. Do you know that year God quadrupled my income? Some of y'all, yeah, if you don't shout for me, listen, some of y'all, you better shout. You better know when to shout. Do you know that year God quadrupled my income? God quadrupled my income. Do you know that year that God blessed my business to grow? He expanded me. He gave me more books and ideas. He expanded me because you know what? I chose not to play with witchcraft, even though here it was, the enemy was showing me like, you got all these bills coming in. You got this much money coming in. If he's paying 1500 a month, man, listen, that's going to take care of your rent and the rest of the bills and whatever you make, you can put up. Oh, it sounded good. It sounded great, but I didn't touch it because it was witchcraft. I didn't touch it. I made a choice, even though, you know, I was going through some stuff. I made a choice. And because I made that choice, God blessed me. Because I made that choice, God blessed me. So I'm trying to encourage some of you to do the right thing. You're trying to take some guy to court. 
to force him to pay uh, for child support and you that that's against the person's will it is witchcraft i know it's controversial to some of you he's supposed to pay of course he's supposed to pay and I, I, trust me when i say god will take it out his tail if you trust god and you release that and you just say god i'm going to just give this to you i repent for what i've done my end in this or the fornication and everything i repent i will never go back to fornication i will never go back i repent and i release this man i forgive him i choose to forgive him i release him lord in the name of jesus and i tell you the truth i am a living witness i'm a living testimony that god will begin to bless you he will begin to open doors some of you are praying to you praying but god is not hearing your prayers it's a prayer going to miss because you have not forgiven people and you're still trying to get revenge through child support you're still trying to get revenge you're talking about i'm gonna take this he got that good job, girl. Yeah, I found out he making this much money a month. Oh, girl, I'm about to get paid. Let it go. Let it go. Release it. Because you were, in, you were in deception, and that's what the enemy wants to do, is he wants to keep you in deception. Release it. Let it go. Let it go. And just walk on and just say, because I had to walk and I was sitting there and there was a time during that walk when I was walking away from that opportunity. And, you know, and then I had to sit, turn around and I'll never forget. It was funny. I had to reach out to his lawyer and say, you know what? Don't even worry about it. We're just going to do the 400. And she said, are you sure? And I'll never forget that conversation. I said, yeah. She said, she got quiet. She said, are you sure? I said, yeah. And I'll never forget what she said. She said, you better than me. <laughs> she told me, she said, you're better than me. But you know something? God quadrupled my income in that year. So if y'all don't want to holler hallelujah for me, I'll do it. Listen, hallelujah to the most high God. I'm telling you the truth. God will bless you when you release people, when you forgive them, when you sit there and you go through the process the right way. Even in the midst of my pain, I chose to forgive. And even in the midst of my pain, I chose to do the right thing. I sat back and said, like I said, I got your passwords through change your password. Change them, change them, change them because I'm in a crazy state right now. I'm in that stage of, uh, of the breakup where, you know, you're in that, that crazy stage. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about, that crazy stage. You know, I'm in that stage right now where, I'm, you know, I really don't trust my thoughts. I don't trust myself right now. So change your passwords. I, I went through the process and I was intentional during the process. So anyhow, guys, I love you. If you want to sow a seed, you can. Y'all going to hear me saying that at the rest um, for the rest of these messages because the Lord's been dealing with me. You're not giving people the opportunity to sow a seed. You know, um. A lot, I know that a lot of times some people, they are so, so broken when it comes to money. It's so distrusting that they always think that automatically that, you know, listen, you ain't supposed to say that or what have you. But no, God said you got to bless people, the ones who want to sow a seed. You can sow a seed. Um, the link will be beneath, beneath the video where you can go to sow a seed. I love you, people of God. I hope this message blessed you. If you have any questions, go to the Ask Tiffany segment on my website. Don't email me, guys, but go to my website and go to the Ask Tiffany segment. And if I get a chance or whenever I can, I will answer you. Please be reminded that if you ask a question that can't really benefit people, I'm more than likely not going to answer. If it's a question about should I leave, leave this uh, job and go here, what have you, that's all about you. You need to go for the paid segment. Um, but if you want to ask a question that most people um, can benefit from whenever I get a chance, I may do a recording or what have you, just like this one, and, and help the other people um, that are in the same situation as you. Anyhow, I love you. I hope this message blessed you and God bless you.